All right, we are on the record to uh, have several issues to take care of this morning. First and foremost is the defense motion for judgment of acquittal, Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, um, pursuant to our discussions yesterday at, uh, in terms of the timeliness of this motion, um, at this point the defense moves pursuant to Minnesota Rule of Criminal Procedure 26.03. Subdivision 18, paren 1, uh, for a judgment of acquittal in this particular case. I'm sure that the court is very familiar with the legal standards applicable in this case. The court needs to view the evidence as presented in the light most favorable to the state. At this point, Your Honor, the defense admits that the state has fa failed to present sufficient evidence, even in the light most favorable to the state, to establish um, two of the principal issues or uh, arguments in this particular case. Um, the use of force and whether the use of force was reasonable, as well as the cause of death of Mr. Floyd. Starting uh, first and foremost with the use of force, uh, what the state has essentially done is provided six different opinions uh, from various uh, police officers or use of force experts, all of which seem to contradict themselves uh, or each other. For example, Sergeant Pluger testified uh, and Sergeant Pluger and Jody Steiger, I would say, are the only two have, who have had a consistent opinion that the use of force became unreasonable at a point that Mr. Floyd ceased struggling. Um, Mr. Zimmerman or Lieutenant Zimmerman had the opinion that even at the point of, sorry, uh, even at the point uh, uh, that the force became unreasonable, use of force became unreasonable when Mr. Floyd was handcuffed. Chief Arredondo, I think, approached it from a different perspective because that was more of a civil employment standard and it was a violation of MPD policy versus a, a real statement in terms of the use of force. Uh, ultimately, the two experts that the state has presented, uh, Jody Steiger and Seth Stoughton, are two, uh, they even disagreed with each other. So you have a myriad of uh, inconsistent, complicated, uh, <laughs> uses of force, use of force opinions um, that really demonstrate the difficulty of establishing beyond a reasonable doubt that the use of force was objectively unreasonable, which is the standard under Graham versus Connor. While they all ultimately said it was objectively unreasonable at some point, the question is, is when is, when did it become? And we have, again, six or seven different opinions on that. Um, in addition, Your Honor, in terms of the medical evidence, um, you again have, as the court is aware, the cause of death. It has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, you have the testimony of Drs. Tobin, Dr. Rich, and Dr. Smock, who ultimately testified as to, and, and Dr. Lindsay Thomas, uh, those four doctors ultimately concluded that it was an asphyxial death. However, the state likewise presented Dr. Baker's testimony, which uh, in large part while he declared it a homicide for medical purposes, which is not a statement of uh, criminal obligations or the criminal standard, uh, Dr. Baker suggested something much different, which was that Mr. Floyd's heart simply couldn't handle the stress uh, of the circumstances. Um, so, Your Honor, you, the state has essentially introduced doubt in the context of providing multiple opinions from multiple experts, all of which seem to contradict each other. And for that reason, we would ask the state to, or excuse me, ask the court to grant the motion for judgment of acquittal. Okay. For the state? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the state opposes the defendant's motion for a judgment of acquittal, the evidence taken in the light most favorable to the state as, we, as we've presented it, uh, establishes all of the elements of all of the crimes charged and negates the defense of reasonable use of force. Uh, the issue is not whether there are uh, inconsistencies, minor inconsistencies in what witnesses say. The issue is whether taken as a whole, uh, the state has proved its case. In terms of the uh, force analysis, a reasonable force, uh, there's no question that the witnesses who have testified have all opined that the uh, defendant's force was objectively unreasonable. Uh, he was not trained to do this by the Minneapolis Police Department. He did not follow policy. He did not follow procedure. Uh, and 
the uh, force that he exercised was unnecessary under the circumstances and simply continued on too long. As to the medical causation issue, Your Honor, the state has introduced evidence that if believed by a reasonable jury, uh, clearly established that the defendant's conduct was a causal factor in bringing about Mr. Floyd's death uh, through the pulmonologist, through Dr. Baker, through the other witnesses who've testified. And so taken as a whole, uh, the state uh, believes that it's established and will establish beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that the defendant is guilty of all charges. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to deny the defense motion for judgment of acquittal. I would note the standard, unlike a jury which has to decide uh, whether the case has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt and in doing so must presume the defendant innocent. The court's duty at this point is to uh, look at a, the evidence in a light most favorable to the state. And even when there are inconsistencies, inconsistencies, major or minor, between witnesses, the jury is free to believe some and not the others. And when viewing a, a set of facts in a light most favorable to the state, they could give their greatest weight to those witnesses who establish that the use of force was reason, unreasonable and that the cause of death uh, was positional asphyxia or lack of oxygen, however the state wishes to characterize it, but most importantly that it was caused by the defendant. That is viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the state. It is clear that that has been established and so based on that standard, uh, the motion for judgment of acquittal is denied. All right, uh, I think we told counsel for Mr. Hall to be available at nine o'clock. Uh, did anyone want to address any issues other than that? I do not, Your Honor. All right. All right, could we, uh, is Mr. Hall present? Okay, uh, why don't we invite them in? They can all be over there. All right, well, let's just reconvene at 9 o'clock then at the scheduled time.
All right, we're back on the record. Uh, parties are present, and now Mr. Isaacman, Ms. Cousins, and uh, Mr. Hall are now present uh, to determine if Mr. Hall will testify. Uh, did either counsel wish to be heard before I inquire of Mr. Hall? Ms. Cousins, if you could come up to the podium. Good morning, Your Honor. Adrian Cousins and Jeff Isaacman appearing on behalf of Mr. Hall, who again is present in the courtroom. Um, Your Honor, where we left, last left off at the last hearing was you had instructed defense counsel to submit a list of questions on a very narrow topic to see whether or not Mr. Hall could answer a very narrowly ta tailored set of questions and whether or not his Fifth Amendment privilege would be implicated in those questions. I've had a chance to review those questions, Judge. I've reviewed them with Mr. Hall. And to summarize, Mr. Hall cannot answer any of the questions that defense put forward. And I'm happy to expand on the reasons why he can't answer any of those questions. Um, uh, let's just focus on how Mr. Floyd looked in the SUV, because that was the very limited group of questions that I thought might not incriminate him. Absolutely, Judge. And if you look at the list that defense proposed, um, I think that that really starts getting into that topic at question seven. So question seven proposed by the defense was, after conducting your business in Cup Foods, did you return to the vehicle with Mr. Floyd? Mr. Hall cannot answer that question. Mr. Hall cannot put himself in that car with Mr. Floyd. Again, this was a car that was searched twice and drugs were recovered twice. If Mr. Hall puts himself in that car, he exposes himself to constructive possession charges of the drugs that were found in that car. And it's important to note, Judge, that Mr. Hall exposes himself to that charge whether or not Mr. Chauvin is convicted or acquitted. Whatever happens with this case, the state can still come back and charge Mr. Hall with constructive possession of drugs in that car, so he can't put himself in that car. Furthermore, the questions that come after that did you notice a change in Mr. Floyd's behavior while sitting in the car? How would you describe his behavior? Did you tell BCA agents that Mr. Floyd was drowsy or asleep? Mr. Hall cannot answer any of those questions without potentially incriminating himself. We discussed this at the last hearing, Judge, but there's a potential third-degree murder liability here under that overdose statute, which again is very broad. If Mr. Hall puts himself in that car, he's now establishing a timeline of events. So let's say Mr. Hall takes the stand. He very limitedly testifies to, this is what Mr. Floyd was doing. This is what, how Mr. Floyd looked. These were his behaviors. This is the change in his behaviors. Let's say Mr. Chauvin is then acquitted. He is now given the state on a silver platter testimony to use against him in a third degree murder charge if they decide to bring it. All right, thank you. Mr. Hall, I'm going to have you uh, step up to the podium because I'm going to ask you a few questions, basically whether you are going to invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege. So if you could swap places with your attorney. Good morning, sir. Good morning. You understand, Mr. Hall, uh, you do have a Fifth Amendment right not to be compelled to incriminate yourself. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. And you understand that applies even when you are not one of the parties to the case, but when you're a witness in a trial. Do you understand that? Yes. You understand that your attorney, and I'm sure they have given you uh, advice, about whether to invoke your Fifth Amendment right against compelled self-incrimination. But ultimately, yeah. it's your choice. You understand yes. that? Yes, sir. All right. And you'll have to speak up just a little bit, and I'll turn up the podium. There we go. Do uh, you understand this is your choice? So you could disregard the advice of your attorneys if you wanted to. Yes, sir. Uh, knowing all that, do you, you've had a chance to look at the questions that were proposed by both sides? I have. Would you be willing to answer those if I were to put you on the stand and swear you in as a witness? No, I am not. Okay, and why would you not answer those? I'm fearful of criminal charges going forward. I have open charges that's not settled yet of my personal stuff. 
So basically, you are invoking your Fifth Amendment right against compelled self-incrimination? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. You can have a seat. Uh, any of the parties wish to be heard on this issue? I think we've had argument already, but just in case there's anything else. Mm. All, right. All right. I'm going to advise both sides to file your proposed questions uh, as essentially an offer of proof on what uh, you would have asked Mr. Hall. But I am finding that he has uh, a complete Fifth Amendment privilege here. Uh, I had earlier said that possibly he could talk about how Mr. Floyd looked in the car, but counsel's argument is persuasive that that could provide a link. And since it's not just evidence that would incriminate a person, but also provide a link to incriminating evidence, I do find that his invocation of his Fifth Amendment rights is valid, and accordingly I am going to quash the subpoena. Anything else? All right, thank you. We'll see if the jury's here, uh, and if they're here by 9.15, we'll start at that time. Anything else for the record? Your Honor, I just need to check to see if my witnesses have arrived yet. Sure. So if they're not, I just need a couple of minutes. Absolutely. Just uh, okay. let Mr. Schaefer know, and we'll, but we'll shoot for 9.15 to reconvene, subject to your witnesses being here. All right, thank you all.
Good morning, everyone. We're going to proceed with the defense case. Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the defense calls Dr. David Fowler. begin by uh, having you state your full name, spelling each of your names. My full name is David Richard Fowler. David, D-A-V-I-D, Richard, R-I-C-H-A-R-D, Fowler, F-O-W-L-E-R. Mr. Nelson. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Fowler, are you presently employed? I am retired. Okay. Um, could you tell the jury a little bit about what you did prior to your retirement? Prior to my retirement, I have been full-time in forensic pathology since about 1986, which is when I first started training in that discipline. And I have been full-time within that discipline for 30-some um, 30, 30 years, whatever that number is. Where did you work prior to retirement? I worked at the Office of the Chief Medical Exa Examiner for the State of Maryland. Do you have any other employment uh, either before your retirement or subsequent to your retirement? Yes, I would do um, the occasional consultation um, case um, during the time prior to my retirement and I have done some since my retirement. Could you tell us a little bit about your education and background? Certainly. I graduated from the University of Cape Town in South Africa in 1983. I did a, a year of internship in general medicine and general surgery. That's required in South Africa before you can get a medical license. I then followed that with a year of um, training in pediatric pathology at the Red Cross Children's Hospital in Cape Town. And completing that year, I entered a full-time five-year training program at the University of Cape Town in forensic pathology. And are you board certified? I am. And so the system in South Africa is that you eventually graduate with a Master of Medicine in your discipline. So I ended up with a Master of Medicine in forensic pathology, which qualifies you in the South African system to be what they call a specialist which in this country is the same as an attending physician, just different terminology. Um, but that's equivalent to board certification here. When I came to the United States, I felt it was very important to get an American qualification if I was going to work in this country um, full time. And so I went back and the American Board of Pathology demands that all pathology training is done in the United States or Canada. So, you know, if I wanted to do that and be eligible for their examination process, I had to then go back and retrain. So I went to the University of Maryland for two years to complete additional anatomic pathology training to qualify me for that portion of the examination process, and then two years of forensic pathology training at the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. I then took my board examinations through the American Board of Pathology um, in anatomic and forensic pathology and um, passed those exams. Great. Um, so how did your career progress after you received all of that education? So at, at about the time that I finished my training, um, I was recruited full-time into the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner as an assistant medical examiner. And that was, year was that? I would have to look at my CV to be absolutely certain, 95 or 96. 
somewhere in that range. Are you a licensed physician in the United States? Yes, I am. Now, you, you were educated in large part in South Africa, but then also here in the United States. Are there some differences between the degrees, or are they the same? There, there are different letters after your name. but So if you go through the system which is derived from the old British examination process, you end up with a MBCHB, and some of them have different letters, which basically mean you have um, two bachelor's degrees, a bachelor of medicine and a bachelor of surgery. And it's a six-year training program, not a four-year training program like you have in the United States. Just different ways of getting to the same end point. If you want to work as a physician in the United States, you have to go through a process um, which when I went through it was run by the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates. And they make an assessment as to whether or not the university that you went to meets the appropriate standards. And these are all universities, um, universities that are approved by the World Health Organization as meeting certain standards. Once you've um, been approved and your um, university is recognized, then you have to go through a set of board examinations which are very similar to all US graduates graduating from a US university. So nowadays they are known as the US MLE examination. So we go through exactly the same process for evaluation. Um, and then you can be, yeah, you, you can apply for a medical license in the United States based on, on that process. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. And in, in terms of, just to clarify, you, you are a licensed physician? Yes, I am. All right. And um, you have board certifications in forensic pathology and anatomic pathology, that's correct? Yes, I do. And you worked as a pathologist or a forensic pathologist in the United States since approximately 1995? So that's when I qualified and f well, finished my training in the United States. But I was working as a pathologist all the way from the time I arrived in 1991. So I've, I've had an uninterrupted work within pathology um, all the way from 1990, when I started my training in pediatric pathology at the Red Cross Children's Hospital, which was probably back in 1985. Um, but some of that is training, so the question is whether you want to count that as being a pathologist or just a trainee pathologist. Okay. What is a pathologist? How would you describe that to the jury? Typically, the pathologist that most people will come across will not come across because they work in the laboratory in a hospital. And they are the individuals who will run the laboratories, and those laboratories are the ones that take the samples which are taken from individuals during treatment by the surgeons and clin other clinicians, physicians, and do the analysis on those. So blood specimens, urine specimens, and then any biopsies or surgical specimens that are removed from an individual are analyzed in the laboratory by a pathologist. And that is the anatomic pathology training, um, as well as some of that is clinical pathology. Okay. Um, can you tell the jury a little bit about your work with the Maryland Medical Examiner's Office? Yes. Um, so having finished my training in forensic pathology, I was recruited, became an assistant medical examiner, did that for several years, and then was offered the position of deputy chief medical examiner. And in Maryland, they have two deputies, one which is in charge of autopsy services and one which is in charge of statewide services. So the one in charge of autopsy services focuses um, most of their work on supervising the autopsy process and the staff that are doing that, um, as well as continuing to do autopsies themselves. Statewide services is the individual who then looks at the investigations which are going on statewide. And so the, this is a big jurisdiction here in Minneapolis, but Maryland, the population served by the medical examiner's office is about six million people. It's the entire state out of one office. And so we have a lot of investigators out in the counties doing work and the coordination and supervision of that falls to the deputy chief for statewide services. So having been the 
deputy chief for Topsy services for several years. The chief medical examiner asked me then to take over statewide services, which I did for several years. Um, I was in that position when he suddenly passed away. So the health department asked me to act as the interim or acting chief medical examiner until they could find somebody to take the position permanently. And, and how long did you act as the uh, chief medical examiner? So I was acting chief Medic medical examiner for about a year. And after a national search, the health department um, appointed me into the position as chief medical examiner. So I believe that was 2002, 2003, about 2003 if I remember correctly. Okay. And you served in that capacity until your retirement? Yes, it was about 17 years in that position. So what type of work is done at the medical examiner's office? I mean, you've explained kind of the differences in the statewide versus the autopsies. So the difference between what's done in the hospital and what's done at a medical examiner's office is in the hospital, the pathologists are looking largely at natural disease. Um, there will be some traumatic specimens, you know, specimens come from trauma patients, but most of what they're doing is looking at natural disease. The forensic pathologist is an individual who's gone on to do that additional training in wound patterns and other non-natural events that threaten life and cause death. So at the end of the process, you have the knowledge base of all the natural diseases that a general pathologist has, plus the additional training to evaluate how people die in unusual circumstances, sudden deaths while not attended, or any deaths which are traumatic. Um, so that's the additional training. That portion is what's done at a medical examiner's office, are these sudden unexpected deaths. And so the best way of thinking of a medical examiner's office is a 24-hour emergency medical institution. People die all the time. It's got to be available 24 hours. All of these deaths, you need to respond to them rapidly and appropriately and in a dignified way. So it's a 24-hour emergency medical institution with the one responsibility at the end of the day of making a determination of the cause of death of the individual um, that has suddenly died. Um, in addition to your work at the medical examiner's office, did you also do some teaching? Yes. Where? So I, I've... I've taught at the University of Maryland. I'm a professor in both pediatrics and um, pathology at that particular institution. I've taught at the, the Johns Hopkins Hospital. I've taught at multiple hospitals in the Maryland DC area. I've taught at the FBI Academy. Um, I've been invited as a guest lecturer and or visiting professor at multiple universities internationally. Okay. Um, in terms of your work as a, the chief pathologist, did you also train other forensic pathologists? Yes. So for a portion of my career, while I was an assistant medical examiner, I was directly responsible for training the forensic pathologists. In other words, when a forensic pathologist trainee, what we would call a fellow, is doing a case, I would be directly supervising everything that they did on that case and it would be my responsibility to ensure that that case was done correctly. And so it's almost like an apprenticeship and they are standing, they're gonna do the case, but you're gonna be watching carefully and evaluating every single part of that process as they gradually grow through that learning curve to become a forensic pathologist. So for a while I was hands on actually teaching at the autopsy table. When I became deputy chief, I continued to do that but one of the roles that was assigned to me was the residency director position for the office. And so that is the position where you supervise the residency program and um, how it, that, that program is accredited and evaluated by an outside agency. So you have to make sure that all of those requirements are done. So that's just an additional layer on top of that. So were you responsible for recruiting the residents and things of that nature? Recruiting, evaluating, bringing them in, and then obviously training, evaluating. And at the end of the process, each of those fellows, before they can take the board exam in forensic pathology, require that the institution 
complete a declaration that they have met the standards in order to practice. And that is before they can take the exam. So they are constantly evaluated daily, quarterly, and then at the end of the year to ensure that they have met the standards that we can attest to, so they are then qualified to take the examination through the American Board of Pathology. And you, um, you've you testified in cases before? Yes. Uh, state and federal? Yes. Civil and criminal? Yes. Can you estimate how many times you've uh, testified in cases over the course of your career? Gosh, over the 30-some years, it, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, now, have you ever published any articles or uh, peer-reviewed journal type information? Both publications and presentations I've been involved. Publications, it has to be closing in on a, on 100, but I haven't looked at my CV and counted them recently. Okay. Um, at the office of the chief medical examiners, do you review every homicide? That was the policy that the, the chief would get to review all homicides all pediatric cases that were under the age of about two years, and then any case which the medical examiner could not determine the cause of death. Okay. And how many h homicides did you review? Typically, the number of homicides in Maryland each year would vary between five and 600. Um, so that would be the homicides alone, and then the other cases that added on to that would add um, an additional load of perhaps 50 to 100 cases. Um, so in this capacity, in this case, are you associated with an organization called the Forensics Panel? Yes. Can you just generally describe what the Forensics Panel is? The Forensic Panel is a, a national organization that evaluates, well not evaluates, but it looks at cases and does evaluations on cases in the forensic sciences, the medical sciences, and the behavioral sciences. So it's a forensic science organization that looks at those particular issues. What is your role with the forensics panel? I am a forensic, patholo forensic pathology consultant. In terms of the forensics panel, um, what's unique about how that organization operates? So the forensic panel really started um, the process of peer review evaluations in order to ensure that the case was diligently evaluated, objectively evaluated, and was based in the known science. So that's the first thing, it's peer review and that has evolved over time. Then it's an organization which has many different disciplines recognized or, or that are recognized working within it. So it's a multidisciplinary team. So you have experts in all sorts of medical fields that can be um, assigned to the case depending on the nature of the case. Okay. It's an independent organization. Um, is it similar to what's called an M&M &M conference? A mortality and morbidity is what you're referring to. That is something very similar that, work, that happens in the average hospital when a patient may have something adverse happen to them, not necessarily fatal, that's the morbidity part, and or it is fatal, mortality, and in those circumstances, physicians will present in a closed environment all of the materials and their evaluation, and the general physician population that have gone to that conference can sit down and critique it, evaluate it, um, and it's an opportunity for uh, self-evaluation, learning for, the, for, for people, and quality assurance for the hospital program. Yes, okay. it's similar. How did you end up working within the forensic panel, and when? About 15 years ago, I was approached by the forensic panel, um, and they indicated that another forensic pathologist had recommended me as, as somebody who might well fit their, uh, their program. And so within the, the panel there, you described it as a multidisciplinary approach. How does that function? So depending on the nature of the case, the forensic panel uh, will assign individuals 
um, that have skills in areas that the case uh, apparently needs from an evaluation process. So, um, and you're compensated for your time. I am. And do you your hourly rate? It's three hundred and fifty dollars an hour. You at some point became involved in this case, State of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin. I did. And how did you become involved in this case? The forensic panel. Um, I, I was approached um, and asked to become part of it, and I felt that this was such a complex and difficult case that this would better fit um, working through the forensic panel than trying to handle this case independently. So I referred this case to the forensic panel. And you, by approached, you were approached by me, correct? I believe that I, believe that, that was the first conversation I had, yes. It right. was a while back. And you referred me to the forensics panel? That's my recollection, yes. Now, in terms of this particular case, how many of these peer reviewers um, were ultimately involved? There were 13 peer reviewers across multiple disciplines that were involved in this case. How is it useful for you to have those uh, peer reviewers involved? Well, several of the peer reviewers, I believe seven, are forensic pathologists, so my direct colleagues with the same training and skill set that you'd expect a good forensic pathologist to have. There were additional individuals in behavioral health, pulmonary um, pulmonologists, emergency room physicians, um, toxicologists that were present as part of the evaluation team because they have the detailed knowledge in those other areas that really helps critique any opinions that I may form and provide their expertise in ensuring that everything was looked at and that any opinion that is expressed is based in science. What's the, um, the process that you apply in approaching a case such as this? So the primary reviewer in a case like that will be provided all of the available information that has been given to the forensic panel. Um, they will go through that material, study it, evaluate it, and then the peer reviewers are given a similar but sometimes slightly less onerous package of materials, but they are given similar materials. They will go through it, and then I would, in this case, as I did in this case, uh, and the I've been a review pathologist on several, and in this case I was the primary. I will do a presentation to the forensic panel. And during that time, they have the opportunity to evaluate and critique my opinion. Based on that, if there's additional information that is necessary in order to help refine the opinions, that request can go back to the forensic panel and through to whichever attorney, whether it be a prosecutor um, or a defense attorney, a plaintiff's attorney or a defense attorney. Requests for the appropriate additional information can be made and if that information is available, sent back so we can complete and try and ensure that we haven't missed anything. So there may be several reviews along the way and then at some point um, if the Objection, Your Honor, to the narrative nature of the response, and, and could we, uh, Your Honor, approach the bench? Sabre.
sure who that is. All right. Um, Dr. Fowler, um, are you familiar with NAME? Yes, I am. And what is NAME? NAME is the National Association of Medical Examiners. And are you a member of NAME? I am. Have you held any leadership positions in that organization? I, I have, yes. Can you, um, well, let me ask you this. Does NAME have an inspection and accreditation process? Yes, it does. Or committee, I should say. Yes, it has a, a committee which does that particular um, task for the organization. What is the responsibility of the inspection and accreditation committee? To evaluate medical examiner and coroner officers. Um, it's a voluntary program. Um, and basically, it means that the medical examiner's office, once they've passed that evaluation and been accredited, have met certain standards that the National Association of Medical Examiners Board of Directors believe are appropriate for the office to have in order to ensure the safety of both the staff that work in the office and also the community that they serve. Are you a member of that committee? I am now, and I was a previous chairman of that committee. D does, does NAME have a standards committee? It does. Right now, they are two separate committees. And Previously, they were both inspection um, and standards were under one committee. Um, at the time, I was the chairperson of that. I chaired. And how, five, but it's how now been separated off into two separate ones. Gotcha. How are um, the standards approved? So the standards are different. As I said, the accreditation checklist is approved by the Board of Directors. The standards are a grassroots um, process where any member of name can suggest a standard. That is then put out to the, pop the general population of members of name. And then those are discussed and voted on at the annual general meeting in the business meeting. And so therefore, anybody out of the hundreds of pathologists that are present at that meeting can stand up and address and debate those particular standards. And then at some point, a vote is called by the chairman of the standards committee as to whether or not that standard would be included or not. And so therefore, it's approved by the general membership, not by the board of directors. And one last question before we move on. When were those standards approved? The initial standards started out in 2005, and then they get updated on a regular basis because medical knowledge changes, and therefore one needs to keep them appropriate um, and fresh. Right. Can you tell me generally what a death investigation is and what it involves? Yes, a death investigation um, is very much like any other medical examination, um, but specifically looking at individuals, obviously, who have died. So there is gathering of information from the scene of the death, um, and that is somewhat to replace the information that a patient would give to their doctor when you walk into the examination room, your doctor, the first question they'll ask you is, why are you here today? Well, deceased people can't speak. And so therefore, the scene information really replaces some of that information. You gather the scene information, you gather past medical records, you then start gathering information from all sorts of pertinent sources. That will be the ambulance or EMT run sheets, the hospital information, if the person made it to the hospital, the current medical information, the past medical information. There will be witness statements. There will be police records, videos. Everything that is available and pertinent will usually be gathered as part of that process. Would it, would it also include things like specimens that are collected? Yes, so if um, a specimen is taken in the hospital, that will be taken. If clothing is available in the hospital and removed from the person during resuscitation, that may well be gathered as well. You know, it, all and everything that is reasonably available that could potentially define how the case um, may 
be evaluated at the end will be gathered um, as, as is reasonable. Um, so yes, hospital specimens. If the person, for instance, went into surgery and a specimen was removed from them during the surgical procedure to try and save their life, that would also be requested. So there's lots of things that um, you would try and get. And is there then, uh, ultimately, it results in a death certificate? Well, there's a lo long process which goes on before that. How long does that process so, take? So you know, the, the process would include an autopsy, which is an external examination of the person, an internal examination of the person, maybe x-rays of the person, CT scans of the person, depending on the resources and, uh, and needs of the case. Um, Additional specimens will be taken at the time of autopsy to look at under the microscope and or send off to a toxicology laboratory. And I'm talking very generally. Every case is going to be different. At the end of that process, you begin the evaluation of the case. In complex cases, certain specimens will be retained and often sent to an expert in that particular area. So some officers have access to a neuropathologist who specializes in looking at brains and spinal cords. So if you have that resource and it's a case where that really may well assist in getting the additional detail that a specialist who only looks at that can provide, then you'll save that specimen and have them look at it um, in conjunction with you. So it's usually an examination of the two with that extra expertise um, at the same time. Are there other factors or other processes that occur? Yes, and, and you know some offices have access to cardiac pathologists. The Maryland office does, and so in many of these complex cases, the heart would be retained and examined by a cardiac pathologist. And you have, you have in fairness, a, pathologist, a general forensic pathologist has a substantial body of knowledge and is very good at identifying most things, but there are cases when somebody who only looks at that one organ is going to have a better eye for detail in that particular area. Um, and so yeah, you can do that. Not all officers have access to, to those resources, but if you have, that's a good thing. So those all add time to waiting for those examinations to be done and the results to be sent back so they can be put into the evaluation matrix, and the jigsaw puzzle of all of the information that you're trying to include, as well as the toxicology results, which take a while to come back, the microscopic examination, which the, the pathologist will do themselves. It takes a while for the glass slides. So some cases can take two to three months. And NAME actually has a requirement that you should complete 90% of your cases within 90 days. Otherwise, you cannot be accredited. They prefer you to do it within 60 days, but 90% of cases should be completed within 90 days. That's three months. And the 10% of cases that aren't completed with it are going to be very complex cases. Often, the deaths in custody and the pediatric um, sudden deaths are the ones that fall into that 10%. So they often go out even further as you, you gather all of that. So um, can you explain what the death certificate is? The ultimately, <coughs> ultimately, a death certificate is issued, right? Correct. And can you explain what the death certificate is? So the death certificate is a, a document that is produced by a physician. The greater majority of them are signed out by physicians within the hospital or nursing home, etc., when people die of natural deaths. Medical examiners are usually exposed to about 25% of deaths within their jurisdiction. So the death certificate is a certification that the person has died, and within a reasonable degree of medical certainty, the certifying physician believes that whatever is on the cause of death line is the cause of death, within a reasonable degree of medical certainty. So let me ask you in terms of this particular case, You've reviewed uh, a substantial amount of information? Yes. Can you just briefly describe uh, the information you've reviewed in this case? Gosh, it goes on for several pages, but there are past medical records, um, 
the records that occurred at, in the hospital at or about the time that Mr. the attempted resuscitation of Mr. Floyd occurred. There are ambulance records, there are, multi, there, there are police records, there's toxicology information. There are multiple videos from multiple sources, both body-worn cameras, surveillance videos from stores, um, and other facilities in that area. There was video material from observers um, that um, is available. Um, there's the toxicological data, there's the autopsy information, the autopsy photographs, um, the microscopic examination. It goes on and on and on. There is a substantial amount of information on this case. And before we kind of get back to the death certificate uh, in this particular case, um, upon your review and based upon your training and education, your experience as a forensic pathologist, have you formed opinions in this case to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes. We'll come back to those shortly. So in terms of the death certificate, are there two parts to that? Yes. And can you explain those two parts? So the first part is what the physician believes to be the cause of death. So that is something that you will put um, what we call part one, that's what the CDC ref refers to it. Um, the death certification process is one which is controlled and governed by the CDC, although each state will have a slightly different format to their death certificate and the way they do things the guidelines that are put out there by the CDC for completion of death certification um, are certainly ones that um, are national. So what's the first part of the death certification according to the CDC? Well, the first part is the primary cause of death. Right. And what's the second part per the CDC? Other significant conditions contributing to death but not directly related to what's in part one. Now, um, I am going to ask, uh, like to show exhibit 193, which is already in evidence. You see that in front of you and ask to publish. You're familiar with this document? I have seen this document, yes. And what is the uh, first part of the certification of death? So the first part here, the cause of death, is cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual, restraint, and neck compression. Now under that, there's a phrase that says underlying. Is that what you're talking about in terms of the second part per the CDC? No, the way the CDC normally phrases it is, you can break it out into multiple lines. So it could be, cardiac arrhythmia due to such and such, due to such and such. And so that's where the underlying conditions come into, into the death certificate. Um, at least you know, when you look at the CDC guidelines and um, the death certificates that I'm used to completing. Okay. The second part that I refer to as part two um, on this death certificate is called other contributing conditions. And what are the other contributing conditions that you review here? And so on this particular death certificate, the certification says that atherosclerotic and hypertensive heart disease, fentanyl intoxication, and recent methamphetamine use are considered contributing conditions. So in, this was uh, prepared by Dr. Baker, correct? Yes, that is, that is my understanding that he was the individual who um, certified this, this case. So in terms of Dr. Baker's analysis of this case, how did the heart and, heart and drugs contribute to the cause of death? They were significant, or other contrib they, they contributed to um, Mr. Floyd having um, a sudden cardiac arrest in my opinion. That's how I would read it. Okay. So um, I'm going to take this down. De uh, if we could unpublish, sorry. Doctor, did you prepare a PowerPoint presentation to walk through your 
uh, opinions in this case? Yes. Judge, I've uh, identified this as demonstrative exhibit 1098, and I'd move to publish. An objection to 1098 for demonstrative purposes only. Mm -hmm. All right, it is received for that purpose alone. So, so before we uh, begin, uh, Doctor, can you sum summarize briefly what your uh, opinions are in this case? Yes. So in my opinion, Mr. Floyd had a sudden cardiac arrhythmia or cardiac arrhythmia due to his atherosclerotic and hypertensive heart disease, or you can write that down multiple different ways, um, during his restraint and subdued by the police or restrained by the police. Um, and then his significant contributory conditions would be, since I've already put the heart disease in part one, he would have the toxicology, the fentanyl and methamphetamine. Um, there is exposure to a vehicle exhaust, so potentially carbon monoxide poisoning, or at least an effect from increased carbon monoxide in his bloodstream, and a paraganglionoma or the other natural disease process that he has. So um, all of those combined to cause Mr. Floyd's death. All right. So let's walk through um, each of these, uh, if we could, starting um, with the opinions of Dr. Baker as far as the cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, before we do that, if we could publish uh, the exhibit, Your Honor. Can you just describe what uh, what this is and why it's relevant to this case? So this is a document that is produced um, as a guide for medical examiners to use when certifying the death and specifically the manner of death. What is the manner of death? So the manner of death is how did the cause of death come about? And you have, a, you have five different choices um, that you can check off or write down on a death certificate as to the manner of death. Now does this document specifically address um, asphyxial deaths, position, it, positional asphyxia deaths? It addresses all sorts of manner of death. Um, and again, it's a guideline okay. put out there to assist medical examiners. Um, and unfortunately, not every case cleanly fits into uh, one particular category or meets the criteria for the guidelines. Okay. So let's talk about, um, in terms of this second slide, um, positional restraint. How does NAME deal with the autopsies and death investigations involving potential uh, positional restraint? So the recommendation is that or it's not a recommendation, they say, you may be classified as a homicide. Okay. Doesn't say, it doesn't say shall or should. It says may be classified as a homicide. Again, we have to recognize that these are medical guidelines. Um, and it then goes on, um, and everybody, I think, can actually easily read that. Um, okay. If you want to go back one and, you know, in such cases, they may not be intent to kill. But the death does res you know, death results from one or more intentional, volitional, potentially harmful acts directed at the decedent, without consent, of course. Further, there is some value to the homicide classification towards reducing the public perception that a cover-up is being perpetrated by the death investigation agency. Now, in terms of the five uh, manners of death that you described, again, uh, we've heard testimony, or the jury has heard testimony from other. Uh, experts who've testified. Uh, there's homicide as one, suicide. Can you describe the others? So homicide, suicide, accident, natural, and then undetermined. Okay. So this next slide, can you describe what undetermined means according to the guidelines? 
So according to the guidelines, undetermined, or the other term on some death certificates is could not be determined, is a classification that's used when the information pointing to one manner of death is no more compelling than one or more other competing manners of death in thorough consideration of all available information. And um, the guidelines also define homicide? Yes. And again, homicide occurs when a death results from a volitional act, in other words, an act a person did, uh, committed by another person to cause fear, harm, or death. Intent to cause death is a common element, but is not required for classification as a homicide. More below. It is to be emphasized that the classification of homicide for the purposes of death certification is a neutral term and neither indicates nor implies criminal intent, which remains the determination within the province of a legal process. Why is that second part important? Because this is a medical opinion that is on a death certificate. The manners of death are unique or virtually unique to the United States of America. These were put on the death certificate by the Center for Disease Control in order to gather information as to how Americans died or die for epidemiological purposes and to study um, and try and prevent deaths. They are not meant to usurp any kind of legal process. And in fact, in many circumstances, regardless of what the medical examiner puts on a death certificate in the way of a manner, the legal system can and will act in a completely independent and different format. Okay. Now, again, um, we discussed a little bit about the CDC uh, death certificates, the instructions. Is this the guideline by the CDC? Yes. And it uh, is to enter all diseases or conditions contributing to the death that were not reported in the chain of events? In part one, in the first, in the, in the first in part, part, yes. Now, back to, um, and if we could take this down for a moment, Your Honor. So with respect to um, Dr. Baker's autopsy, I just wanna talk a little bit about the cardiopulmonary arrest that he references. What are the findings that were relevant to your analysis in this particular case? There are substantial pertinent negatives in this particular case that drove my opinion. Okay. What, what about the size of the heart? So there are, again, certain pertinent positive issues. Mr. Floyd's heart was enlarged. There are multiple methods and studies that have been done on the size of the heart in the United States. Um, there's one study out of the medical examiner's office in San Antonio, Dr. Molina and DeMaio, uh, where they took a series of individuals who died suddenly with trauma and hopefully eliminated as part of that process natural disease that might have caused alterations in the heart size. Excuse and me, doctor. Did you prepare a slide relevant to this and if we can publish it? Yes, I it? did. Okay. So the Molina study you were refer referencing? Right. So in their study, they found that 95% of males had a heart weight of between 233 and 383 grams. Anybody outside of those limits, and you would expect about 2.5% to be lower and 2.5% to be higher. That's the 95% certainty um, on either side of the mean. And so that is what they proposed as being the reference range for adult males. Now how, is the, how about the Mayo study? So the Mayo study is one where you can go in and calculate the weight based on the size of the individual, which is potentially more accurate. Because you don't really want to take um, 130 pound, five foot five male, and say, you know, and, and plug them into 
a particular range, you'd expect their heart to be smaller, as most of their organs would be smaller. And Mr. Floyd was a very tall, robust looking individual. So I would expect him to have a larger heart. And so the type of study, such as the Mayo study, um, where they put in the sex of the individual, male, the height and the weight, and then come out with, as part of that calculation, accounting for that, the 95th inclusion rate would top out at 510 grams in this circumstance. So Mr. Floyd's weight at five, heart weight at 540 is outside this range. I will tell you, there's another, there are multiple studies. There's another one out of Chicago and Northwestern University, which has even broader range and would indicate that Mr. Floyd was within the 95 centile, but still right up at the very top end of normal. Bottom line is, he has an enlarged heart. Okay. If we could uh, unpublish this, Your Honor. So in terms of that's what you ultimately kind of see as relevant evidence here is, is that Mr. Floyd had a, an enlarged heart. Yes. How does the size of the heart affect um, the blood supply, nutrients, oxygen, things of that nature? The heart is a muscle and it's dependent on the supply of oxygen, glucose, and other important nutrients to function. When a heart or any other muscle grows in size, its consumption of those vital components increases. So Mr. Floyd's heart would have twice the need of those nutrients compared to a 260 gram heart or 270 gram heart, which would be halfway. It would be right in the middle of the Molina study criteria um, because there's just twice as much heart muscle to support um, and each of those cells is, is bigger and requires more oxygen. So it's kind of like the law of supply and demand, right? Correct. All right. What happens to a person when they experience um, like a lack of supply, so to speak? So like every other organ, the heart has certain reserves of energy built in. The typical amount of reserve in our brains is enough for us to maintain consciousness for about 10 to 15 seconds. And that is the organ which is most sensitive to constant supply. The heart or the brain? No, the brain. The heart is the next. But like other organs, it will be able to maintain function even when the supply is reduced or even completely cut off. But at some point, you do have to resupply because those reserves are when the heart is being exerted, are being used. And you either have to completely replace them or if you only partially replace them, at some point, you're going to exhaust, exhaust the reserves. So how do we replenish the supply, so to speak? The replenishment comes through the coronary arteries and they bring blood into the heart as that blood arrives it delivers oxygen and other nutrients and it also removes the byproducts of the metabolism of those heart muscles as they contract so what type of symptoms might someone who um, show if they are diminished in their supply? So at some point there are a variety of symptoms that can result, you can become, you can feel your heart racing, you may even get palpitations, you get potentially short of breath, um, and in some circumstances uh, you may start getting chest pain, what we refer to as angina, and it can get even worse than that. You can have um, sudden symptoms such as a collapse without any warning but you know, there's a spectrum of, of different symptoms that can occur. So when the supply isn't being met what would a person customarily do to replenish the supply? Well you know when one becomes short of breath you tend to relax, ease up, back off, 
stop walking, stop running, stop exercising until such time as you feel like you've, you've, you've got your heart rate down. Some people monitor their heart while they're exercising to ensure they don't go over certain limits. Um, so there are different ways of doing it. But typically, um, if, you, if you experience symptoms, it's your body telling you, slow down. And what happens if someone doesn't do that? If you don't, and you don't heed those warnings, or you can't heed those warnings for other circumstances, the consumption of those, metabol of those essential metabolites goes on. The production of the products of contraction, which need to be removed, continues to increase. And at some point, um, the heart will fail, go have a sudden cardiac arrest slash arrhythmia, that's what you expect to see. So, I mean, in, within the field of forensic pathology, what would you call the stopping of the heart? We typically call it sudden cardiac arrest or cardiac arrhythmia. What's the difference between sudden cardiac arrest and arrhythmia? A sudden cardiac arrest really is an observational situation. You, you, you observe the person suddenly stop functioning. And usually the background process is an arrhythmia of some sort, okay. often starting out as a relatively benign arrhythmia and then progressing into a more malignant arrhythmia, which then um, decreases the function of the heart and eventually the heart fails. Okay. Um, so what types of things might cause a heart to be bigger like Mr. Floyd's? The commonest one in the United States, which, States, which is part of the developing world, is hypertension what we would call essential hypertension. It just happens. And based on what you reviewed, uh, did you determine whether Mr. Floyd had hypertension? The size of the heart would be extremely good evidence that he had hypertension. Secondly, there are medical records that I did see where he had an elevated blood pressure um, at previous hospital administrations or previous clinical interactions. So yes, there's evidence that he, he had that. And then there was something else found at autopsy, um, a tumor that is sometimes associated with hypertension as well in certain people. That's a paraganglioma? Paraganglionoma, yes. Anoma, sorry. Uh, we will talk about that a little bit later. Um, so just kind of generally, can you describe the major blood vessels of the heart? Yes. There really are two major blood vessels, the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. The left coronary artery, within a very short distance of coming off the aorta, divides into two major arteries, the left anterior descending and the left circumflex. So some people call it three coronary arteries, but technically there are two with one dividing into, into two. Uh, Really, um, neither description would be incorrect. And what is narrowing or stenosis of the arteries? So narrowing or stenosis of the arteries means that the arteries, the lumen, the inside diameter of that artery is smaller than it should be. It has been narrowed by a disease process. Okay. Um, how does long-term drug use affect narrowing of the arteries? There are certain drugs that do cause um, advanced or more rapidly advancing atherosclerosis. Not just drugs, but many um, substances and toxins, even smoking, for instance, is associated with earlier atherosclerosis. And certain drugs um, and other drugs, substances, can be added on to, to that particular. Dose. So even urban pollution has a risk of advancing heart disease. And what specific drugs? Well, in this particular case, methamphetamine, which was present in Mr. Floyd, has been associated with earlier onset of narrowing of the coronary arteries by atherosclerosis. And can you describe the difference between proximal and distal narrowing of the arteries? Right. So the narrowing can occur anywhere up and down the artery. When it occurs close to its origin, i.e. close to the aorta where the blood supply comes from, we will call that proximal. 
If it occurs far down the, or the artery towards the end of the artery or further down the artery, it's called distal. The implications are somewhat different. And if you have narrowing close to the beginning of the artery, anything downstream from that narrowing is subject to decreased supply of blood. If you have it further down and distal, then the first part and all the branches that come off the first part are supplying that heart and that part of the heart will still receive enough supply. It's not restricted. But once you get to beyond the narrowing, any tissue, heart tissue, muscle downstream from that is going to be subjected to a reduced supply. Okay. And so in this particular case, he had significant narrowing of all of his coronary arteries close to their origin, which really is consistent with all of his heart, unfortunately, being subjected to reduced supply, not just a portion of his heart, but the entire heart. Uh, is there a, a certain amount of narrowing or, uh, that forensic pathologists consider to be enough to cause sudden death? So the, the typical conventional number that forensic pathologists use is between 70 and 75 percent narrowing is a risk factor for sudden cardiac death. Can you um, survive with uh, greater than 75 percent narrowing? Oh, absolutely. I have seen many, many cases where um, it can be 90, 95 percent. Again, it depends where on the artery it is. So a proximal narrowing is more dangerous than a distal narrowing because only part, part of the heart. And, and in this particular case, we know Mr. Floyd had 90% narrowing, so he was walking around with 90% stenosis beyond the 75, and that was not affecting him as part of his daily activities. So when he was at rest, walking around, doing his normal daily activities, I know of no information that he was symptomatic or having any problems. So yes, you can go beyond 75%. That's why cardiologists may conclude you could survive with greater than 75%? Yes, so I think the difference is that medical examiners see people who've died with 75%. And cardiologists see people who are walking around with 90%. So they see the live population, we see the dead population. And so we probably end up with different standards based on, unfortunately, that that's what we see. So in terms of an autopsy finding, um, can you describe what myocyte necrosis is and um, how, whether that's uh, necessary to diagnose a sudden cardiac death? So myocyte necrosis um, is both something you can you have to visualize it microscopically. You have to look at the individual heart cell. The myocyte is just a word which is heart cell. Um, you can infer that there may be myocyte necrosis at autopsy if you see bleeding into the heart itself. But it is a microscopic um, diff, you know, diagnosis and it is not necessary for myocyte necrosis to be present for a sudden cardiac death. So someone who has a sudden cardiac death may not have myocyte necrosis? Correct. Why might that uh, happen? Why might someone not have that myocyte necrosis? Again, it, the heart goes through a process of dying. It takes a while for a heart to die and for the actual myocytes to start showing the changes that we can see under a microscope. I think we, we, we need to understand that that's why you can do heart transplants. In somebody who has been injured or suffered some other catastrophe to their brain and is brain dead and is a donor, their heart can be removed, put on ice, flown across the country and put into another person without any damage to that heart. And that, that process takes hours. So if the death is rapid, 
you will not see myocyte necrosis. It's the, it's the time frame from the heart stopping to the time we typically see myocyte necrosis is going to be somebody who has had symptoms and survived for a period of time so that that process can advance to the degree where we can see it under the microscope. Okay. Now, you've kind of talked about sudden cardiac events. Um, let's talk about the arrhythmia. Can you describe what is called the conduction system of the heart? The conduction system of the heart is a very important part of the orderly contraction of our heart. We have two chambers which receive blood from the body, the atria, and then we have two bigger, very muscular chambers the ventricles that pump blood under high pressure to the body. And so the way the heart works is it's a two chamber on each side. The one side supplying the lungs and the other side supplying the body where the atria contract and push blood into the ventricles to fill them up. And then the ventricles contract to push blood to the body. The ventricles are very powerful and there's a valve in between them to stop the blood flowing back. So what you need is an orderly contraction process where the atria contract first, followed by the ventricles. This is coordinated by the conduction system. And we have in the heart what is known as the cardiac pacemaker. It's a generic term. Um, but it's the little piece of modified heart muscle that actually has almost nerve-like function. Does that and have a name? Sorry. It's called the sinoatrial nerve. And that generates the initial activity which causes the atria to start contracting and between it and another node which is at the junction of the atria and the ventricles called the atrioventricular node, there is a little bundle of modified heart muscles that conduct that down and then there are further modified heart muscles that go down to spread the impulse, the electrical impulse, to the heart to cause it to contract. What are those called? That's, you know, it's the bundle of his pakanji um, fibers, etc. They will have medical terminology, but basically it's modified heart muscle um, cells. So what that does is the sinoatrial node fires and the impulse is conducted down the fibers to the AV node. At that time, the um, atria contract, forcing blood into. At the time that the impulse arrives at the ventricles, that node then fires shortly after the atria, and the heart contracts and sends the blood on its way. Um, so you get this orderly double beat to the heart. You can hear the valves opening and closing atria first and then the ventricles and that's the sound that the physician listens to when he puts a stethoscope over your heart. And that's the, like the blood pressure? Sorry? Is that blood pressure? Or? So the blood pressure is actually generated by the contraction of the ventricles. Um, that's the essential output of the heart is directly related to the volume and the pressure of blood f that is pushed out of the heart. Okay. So what happens if this conduction system gets impaired? Then you don't have orderly contraction of the heart. <clears throat> and so if they fire at the wrong time, then if you had the atria and ventricles firing at the same time, you would move no blood. The ventricles are very powerful. They slam that valve shut. The atria fire at the same time. They can't force blood past it. And so you've got no flow to fill the ventricles. And is that an arrhythmia? That's an arrhythmia. So there are multiple different types of arrhythmias that, that, that are documented. And um, what can happen, um, well, can sudden death happen as a result of an arrhythmia? Absolutely. So which artery supplies the, that pacemaker, the SA node that you described? The sinoatrial node is supplied by a small branch that comes off the right coronary artery. And did you review again the autopsy and observe findings relevant to Mr. Floyd's right coronary artery? 
Yes, so unfortunately, that was the artery which showed the greatest degree of narrowing. Which was how much? 90%. Does that increase or that type of narrowing increase um, the risk for sudden death? Yes, in that if and when the blood supply needs of the heart on the right side increase, and that's also going to apply to the sinoatrial node, um, are not met, that sinoatrial node will not function properly and the will not fire properly and you will end up with an arrhythmia of some sort. So essentially if it if it misfires there's no pacemaker, right? Or that that, that yeah that is correct, yes. How does exertion come into the analysis? Exertion basically increases the demand for oxygen throughout the entire body, mostly because of the muscular activity. So as we exercise, our heart rate and our breathing rate normally compensate to increase the oxygen that we're bringing into the body through the respiratory system and increase the amount of blood, or amount of oxygenated blood, which has been distributed to the body. And the way that that increase of blood, the, the way the body increases the blood supply is to increase the rate of the heart. So we will go from our resting heart rates, which are somewhere between 60 and 100. We'll push it up to 120, 140, 150, depending on the degree of exertion. And beyond, it gets dangerous. So essentially, the more exertion, the more oxygenated blood is needed. Yes. How do drugs like methamphetamine come into play as far as the, uh, in terms of the conduction system? So methamphetamine is dangerous at, at several levels in this particular case. One, it has known arrhythmogenic potential. In other words, it sensitizes the heart to arrhythmias. It makes, you know, it's just been documented that people on methamphetamine have a, an increased risk of um, an arrhythmia. Secondly, it increases the rate that the heart beats at. As a stimulant, it pushes the heart beat rate up. So therefore, the heart is now going to demand increased oxygen, the heart muscle itself. And thirdly, it is a vasoconstrictor. What is a vasoconstrictor? So a vasoconstrictor is a substance which causes blood vessels, usually arteries, to narrow. And it's physiologically important, and it is protective in certain circumstances, but can become dangerous in others. And the way a vasoconstrictor works in most circumstances is to act on the muscular layer that's present in arteries. Our arteries have multiple different layers, and there's a muscular layer in there, and it causes that muscular layer to begin to contract. A little bit of contraction, that's good. Too much contraction and it can slow down the blood beyond what is necessary and even in certain circumstances you can stop the blood by giving a vasoconstrictor substance. Okay. Um, so in this particular case we've got an enlarged heart, right? Yes. Um, we have a heart that has narrowed coronary arteries, right? Yes. And based on your review of the video evidence, you ob observed a pretty significant struggle between Mr. Floyd and the three officers? Correct. Methamphetamine on board, which is a vasoconstrictor? Yes. Have you or your colleagues ever certified a death due to the um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Yes, it's a very, unfortunately, very common cause of, of death. And, and even at these levels of narrowing, 75 and 90? Anything above 75%, as I previously mentioned, meets the criteria for enough narrowing, at least within the community of practicing forensic pathologists. Have you ever um, performed an autopsy sort of expecting one cause of death but finding another? That's 
why we perform autopsies. Um, it is a thorough investi internal examination to identify anatomic deviations from normal and so therefore your preconceived notion uh, a, a common I wouldn't say a common example but we see it every now and then would be a motor vehicle collision where somebody has multiple injuries and you look at them and go okay they've got enough injury there to kill them but when you go in you can see evidence that they had a stroke or a heart attack and that what's, that's what potentially caused them to lose control of their vehicle at the time that they had and got all their multiple injuries. And so then we sit with the issue of, do we put the heart attack under part one or do we put the heart attack and or the stroke type findings under significant conditions? Because obviously they were driving their vehicle, but it may have caused them to lose consciousness. You know, so these are just dilemmas that we face as to where you put things on a death certificate and sometimes you're not right and you're not wrong. Um, how about hypertensive cardiovascular disease? Um, how does that relate to a cause of death? So again, there are a number of sudden cardiac deaths that are related solely and exclusively to the increased size of the heart. And so those are the ones that, since hypertensive disease is the most common cause of an enlarged heart, we will typically use that as the cause of death and say hypertensive cardiovascular disease. Have you ever uh, certified a death due to hypertensive cardiovascular disease? Yes, I have, multiple times. Have you diagnosed both hypertension and coronary artery disease as a cause of death in combination? Yes, and again, that is e probably even more common because a significant proportion of the population have hypertension, so their hearts are enlarged, and as you get older, you tend to lay down deposits of material in your, in your arteries, and so there's often both are present in, in many, many cases, unfortunately. Now, again, in terms of hypertensive uh, cardiovascular disease, we talked earlier about kind of the struggle between Mr. Floyd and the officers getting into the squad car. Um, how does that type of exertion play into hypertensive cardiovascular disease? It increases both with the hypertensive and the atherosclerotic, it increases the demand and the stress on the heart. and the more the individual is stressed, um, both you know, physically and in other ways, the more the demand on the heart is going to increase. So in terms of stress, right, how does that affect the heart? So we have certain innate stress mechanisms built into us, reflexes built into us. Um, it's called the fight and flight reflex, um, is the common terminology that you will see within the um, medical literature and also within the lay literature. And this is a mechanism where if you are in a stressful situation, it prepares your body to be able to cope with the stressful situation. And what happens generally is the sympathetic part of your nervous system begins to act. That causes secretion of adrenaline as one of the examples and, 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 me, and perhaps other catecholamines which are substances that are part of that sympathetic nervous system and adrenaline causes your some of your blood vessels to constrict it's another potent vasoconstrictor the idea being that you don't need to digest the food in your stomach for instance while you're in a, in a very very dangerous environment so it really shunts the blood, pushes the blood to the organs that are more important, the heart, the lungs, the brain, your muscles. Um, it also shuts down the blood supply to your skin. Yeah. It, it, so there, it, it, it does all of those things. But it also speeds up the heart to increase the cardiac output to maintain oxygenation of the brain, your muscles, and other things so that you can have an additional reserve 
to fight that threat. All right. Now, so the the fight or flight kind of uh, that you described it in, in increases adrenaline, right? It causes the heart to beat faster. Agreed. Yes, and yes. And the and the adrenaline, uh, how does that come into play? Is that did you say that was a vasoconstrictor? So adrenaline is a vasoconstrictor, yes. A including the arteries? Oh yes. And ultimately what does that do potentially? So it narrows the arteries. And again, we have smooth muscle in the cardiac arteries. So there's a potential of the adrenaline and the methamphetamine further narrowing those arteries in the heart as well as arteries elsewhere in the body, restricting blood flow. Now, in terms of that kind of stress reaction, and I, I would like to craft this question carefully. Um, the jury saw some evidence, which I know you reviewed as well, of an incident in 2019, about a year prior to Mr. Floyd's death, where Mr. Floyd was stopped by the police, was seen or believed and admitted to ingesting some controlled substances at that point, and was subsequently seen by paramedics. Do you recall that information in the information you reviewed generally? I did. And at the time that he was initially um, seen by paramedics, he his blood pressure was taken, and if I'm not mistaken, it was 216 over 160. What does that signify to you as far as this stress relation? So a high blood pressure like that, and that's, that's markedly elevated, um, could be due to his hypertension being out of control. But this is, this is much higher than I would expect. Secondly, it could be part of the stress reaction where adrenaline is being secreted and it's pushing his heart rate up and that will increase your blood pressure. And if adrenaline is secreted, it's also causing vasoconstriction. So there's more blood staying within the central vasculature and so therefore that will also increase your, your, your blood pressure. There, there are multiple explanations for that, but certainly stress would be one of them. Okay. Your Honor, I believe that right now would be a good time for our mid-morning break. Mm -hmm. There's a we'll take 20 minutes. minutes. Let's reconvene at 11.10.
my introduction still under oath? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Dr. Fowler, uh, right before the break, uh, we were discussing uh, Mr. Floyd's heart and the uh, contr contributions uh, to, of Mr. Floyd's heart to his death. Um, did you form, in your opinion, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, what you thought was the principal cause of Mr. Floyd's death? Yes. And what is that? Cardiac arrhythmia due to hypertensive atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease during restraint. Now, in terms of the uh, other contributing factors to Mr. Floyd's death, did you, as a part of your review, make other considerations to things that may have contributed? Yes, I did. Um, I'd like to discuss with you um, car <coughs> carbon monoxide, or CO. Okay. You've reviewed all of the videos in the case, correct? I did. Did you uh, pay attention to where Mr. Floyd's head was positioned relevant to the squad car? Yes, I did. Which way was his face, nose, mouth facing? His face was facing towards the vehicle, um, towards the rear of the vehicle, and directly towards the area where you would expect the tailpipe or tailpipes of a vehicle to be. And let me just um, ask you, are you suggesting that Mr. Floyd died from carbon monoxide poisoning? Absolutely not, no. Not a full carbon monoxide poisoning, no. All right. Now, um, I'd like to, if the court could publish, uh, and before the court does, the next slide uh, has a screenshot from Officer King's body worn camera at 202409. Uh, do you see that in front of you there? Sir? I do not at this time, no. Okay. How about now? Yes. All right. Um, Your Honor, I have independently marked this single slide as exhibit 1058. And based upon discussions with counsel, I'd move for its admission. Any That's objection? No objection, no. 1058 is received. A permission to publish? <coughs> All right. uh, Dr. Fowler, based on your review of the videos and evidence, were you able to determine if the vehicle was running? There was evidence that the vehicle was running. What would that evidence consist of? What I observed was a collection of fluid. I don't know if this is working. Maybe I'm doing the wrong way. Collection of fluid. Objection, Your Honor. May we approach?
Objection is overruled. Dr. Fowler, um, based on your general knowledge as a forensic pathologist, your personal experiences, um, what comes out of a car's exhaust? Typically, we see the products of combustion. It's an internal combustion engine coming out the exhaust. And the major products of combustion are going to be water vapor, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and then a couple of other very small other particulate and uh, minor gases that come out of, out of the exhaust pipe. Is carbon monoxide toxic? It is an extremely toxic gas. How does it act as a poison? Carbon monoxide attaches to the hemoglobin in our red blood cells and it attaches to those red blood cells more tightly than oxygen. So it competes for the same binding position on the hemoglobin that oxygen does. And since it is a better um, and, and, and it binds more firmly, the oxygen can't displace it. So as the percentage of carbon monoxide bound to your hemoglobin in your bloodstream slowly goes up, you lose that portion of your oxygen carrying capacity. So if you have a 10% carbon monoxide saturation in your bloodstream, you've lost 10% of your oxygen carrying capacity. Okay. Can that cause ultimately death? When you get to levels um, way in excess of 50-60%, people typically, uh, even young healthy individuals will start to die. The issue is that people with significant heart disease and re reduced capacity in their heart are going to be adversely affected earlier. And so there are certainly many examples in the literature of people dying in an environment where multiple people are exposed, but one person dies at, and I've seen this, less than 20%, and the others die at um, varying levels above that. So it's not universal that everybody will require to get to 60, 70, 80%. Um, that's a young, healthy individual. But people with predisposing conditions who are vulnerable will die at much lower levels. So in terms of the literature, are you familiar generally with the literature on um, carbon monoxide poisoning? Yes. Specifically, are you familiar with the paper by DeMaio and Dana on carbon monoxide poisoning in open spaces? Yes, that is a paper that came out in the late 80s, I believe. And is this uh, here as a part of your PowerPoint, uh, that article, or the title of that article? Yeah, this is the title, title um, sheet or title portion of that particular paper that was published by the two doctors, yes. And that was in the late 80s, you said? Correct. Are you familiar with CDC warnings on carbon monoxide in open spaces? Yes. Can you describe what this slide represents? So this is, this is the um, outdoor air recommendations. So we're not talking about indoor air, outdoor air recommendations by the EPA. Um, and recommending that individuals are not exposed to more than nine parts per million um, for eight hours. Anything above an eight hour exposure puts you at risk of absorbing carbon monoxide, which can put you at, at risk of at least symptoms, if not more. And when you go up to 35 parts per million, so not a much of an increase, that exposure limit drops to one hour. So in terms of the CDC versus the EPA, what does the CDC say? Well, they, they both, both, both saying, just be careful of carbon monoxide regardless of your environment. Are you familiar with the Consumer Product Safety Commission scale? So, excuse me, the C Consumer Product Safety Commission? Yes. Is that uh, the information that you obtained for this case? So this is the um, top of the page okay. that um, they refer to. And um, if you go to the next slide, it actually says what it says on the, on the page. And basically, they're saying 
that most people will not experience any symptoms from a prolonged exposure to carbon monoxide between 1 and 70 parts per million. Um, but some heart patients may experience an increase in chest pain, in other words become symptomatic um, in that range. As CO levels increase and remain above 70 parts per million, symptoms become more noticeable and conclude headache, fatigue and nausea. And once you get above 150 to 200 parts per million, people become disoriented, unconscious and death are possible. So the higher the level, the more rapid and the more serious the potential consequences of exposure to a source of carbon monoxide is. Are you also familiar with the World Health Organization standards? Yes. Is that the next slide? So this is just again the, the header from their, their document. The relevant information is on the next slide. And they go a little further than the EPA giving us more data. And what they do is they've got the same nine parts per million for eight hours. Their recommendation is not more than 26 parts per million for eight hours, not the 35 that the CDC, uh, um, the EPA has. At 52 parts per million, the risk of exposure um, issues occurs, in, in, you get in 30 minutes at 52 parts per million, um, which is in that one to 70 range that the EPA said is okay. Um, and then at 87 parts per million, 15 minutes is all it takes to start getting yourself into uh, having absorbed um, a decent amount of carbon monoxide. Now, you're, you're not a mechanic, correct? No. <laughs> all right. But are you aware of some just sort of general standards in terms of the emission of carbon monoxide by vehicles? Yes, I am. It's part of the general knowledge that forensic pathologists have as to the different types of sources of carbon monoxide. And would that include the California Air Resources Board? Yes, this is one of the most strict automobile emission uh, uh, regulations. And what does the regulations stand for? So the in, in California, and it's been adopted in about 14, 15 states around the country, so California has been copied. Um, to, you know, by various of the states. Some states have not copied it. I could not find any reference to Minnesota being um, a CARB state. Okay. So, but adopting the California stringent um, regulations, a vehicle may emit up to 1,200 parts per million of carbon monoxide from its exhaust. And I'm going back to the prior slide, where would that fall within the World Health Organization or, uh, World Health Organization guidelines? Well, they go up to 87, we're talking 1,200, so we're talking in excess of 10 times, 12, now, 13 times. Now again, you're not suggesting to the jury that Mr. Floyd died of carbon monoxide poisoning? Not exclusively, no. Okay. Um, how would you be able to determine the, the role that carbon monoxide played in a particular death. Typically, and the easiest way for a medical examiner to do that is to have the blood tested by a laboratory for what we call carboxyhemoglobin saturation. And it will come back from the laboratory giving us a percentage saturation. To your knowledge, was Mr. Floyd's blood tested for carbon monoxide? I could not find a reference to it now. Now, the previous articles that we kind of looked at, the DeMaio, I think you said, uh, from the late 80s, are there more recent studies on the effect of uh, carbon monoxide exposure in open spaces? Yes. Is that uh, this? Oops. Mm, yeah. No. May have gotten mixed in here. I don't think I put this into the oh. PowerPoint, Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Nelson. Right. Yes, there's a recent study um, or case report that came out of um, Poland where a taxi driver committed suicide by taking his vehicle, parking it in an open space, taking one of the mats out of the vehicle, putting it behind the vehicle, and then lay down on the mat and inhaled the exhaust. And he ended up with a very high level of carbon monoxide. It was in the 80s. Um, certainly sufficient to be an exclusive cause of death in that particular case. The interesting thing about that particular study was it provided 
no new information is carbon dioxide is dangerous. And carbon dioxide comes out of exhausts, and you can do this because it replicated what De Maio and Dana had done 20, 30 years before. But what was done in that particular case was that the authorities tested the amount of carbon monoxide coming out of the exhaust. So they did a recreation reenactment and took carbon monoxide sensors and put them at approximately the place where the man's m nose and mouth were and then monitored the carbon monoxide coming out of this vehicle. So the principle that you can test a vehicle and make a determination exactly how dangerous it is was properly tested in that particular case and they found that when the breeze was blowing or the wind was blowing at or about this man's face and he was about a foot away to give you a reference the when the wind was blowing the amount of carbon monoxide picked up by the sensor was 200 parts per million and when the wind dropped it went up to 790 parts per million which is again almost 10 times the World Health Organization's recommendation. So in the area close to an exhaust you're going to have a much higher level of carbon monoxide than you would if you're three, four feet away. Okay. Now um, to your knowledge were similar uh, experiments done in this case or recreations? I did not see any um, information that indicated that a similar recreation or um, was done in this particular case now. In terms of uh, modern vehicles, they have catalytic converters, correct? Absolutely. And what does a catalytic co converter do relevant to carbon monoxide? It reduces it dramatically. So in the era before catalytic converters, the amount of carbon monoxide coming out of a typical car exhaust would exceed 30,000 parts per million and could be as high as 70,000 parts per million. So the catalytic converter and the modern emissions controls that you see on, at least in the California requirements, which are again the most strict, um, have reduced it by about 30 times to somewhere close to 1,000 to 1,200. Now in terms of, um, can you describe for the jury what a pulse oximeter is? Yes, a pulse oximeter is a device that you put on the finger, it's a little clamp that you put on the finger and it reads two things, your pulse rate and the oxygen saturation in your blood. So it counts the pulses and it reads how much oxygen you're carrying in your blood by looking at the color of your fingernail. How, um, how does carbon monoxide come into play in terms of pulse oximeter? So the important thing is it appears to be oxygen. It changes the blood to a color which the pulse oximeter thinks is oxygen. So if you take somebody who has 50% saturation with carbon monoxide, it will still read that the person is 95% oxygen. It doesn't tell you that there's 50%. So if a pulse oximeter was put on Mr. Floyd's finger in the vehicle and again in the hospital, the pulse oximeter does not give us any information allowing us to say he was or was not under the influence of some degree of carbon monoxide intoxication. How long does carbon monoxide typically stay in the bloodstream? So it stays in the bloodstream um, if you want to treat a person and put them on 100% oxygen. The half-life is about an hour and a half to two hours. If you're exposed to ambient air, it takes much longer to get rid of the carbon monoxide. And so, I mean, essentially removing that carbon monoxide from the bloodstream is a reversible process. It's not an irreversible bond, it is reversible. So yes, it will at some point slowly dissociate and be blown off. We do generate a small degree of carbon monoxide as part of our normal metabolism. It's a very low sub 1% and it binds to the, to, to the hemoglobin and eventually dissociates and is eliminated. So um, in small amounts, 
I'm not an issue, and yes, it will dissociate and be blown off at some point as part of the normal metabolism. So how about how much carbon monoxide is it is needed to be absorbed into the bloodstream uh, to diminish the oxygen supply? Well, for a young, healthy individual, you want to probably exceed the 60, 70, 80 percent range. That's what we typically see. However, in individuals who have risk factors, that can be far, far less. How, what type of risk factors would you look for? So these are particularly, uh, the, the, the individuals that are particularly at risk are people with cardiovascular disease, as we saw in Mr. Floyd, and people with chronic obstructive lung disease would also be a, have a higher risk, um, and then other comorbidities, kidney disease, etc. But the real um, high risk one is going to be heart. And what percentage would you expect in when someone presents with those conditions? Very difficult to predict in because everybody is different. Um, there are studies out there where as little as six percent saturation with carbon monoxide in an individual who's exercising with heart disease will start causing arrhythmias. So it's a very low percentage. Now you have to have all of this, the heart disease and exercise. But at about 6%, there have been studies done in a controlled laboratory environment where people started showing EKG changes and premature ventricular contractions at about 6%. So it has potential to affect individuals at much lower levels than you would require for a young, healthy individual. Now, in terms of findings at autopsy, um, are there certain things at autopsy that can determine the, um, what the presence of carbon monoxide or certain observations the physician, that the pathologist can make? Yes, typically carbon monoxide makes the blood appear, and, 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 the, and the terminology, it looks like it's cherry red in color. It's not the standard pink or slightly darker red color that we would see for deoxygenated blood. It's a, it's a fairly bright cherry red color. Hence the reason the pulse oximeters get somewhat confused as well. Now when you get levels of 50, 60, 70 percent, and the greater majority of the blood is carboxyhemoglobin, it stands out. But when you're looking at levels that are 10 percent, 20 percent, it doesn't and is not easy to see. A typical smoker, one pack a day, will have and can have a carboxyhemoglobin of 6 percent. Two packs a day, you can get up to 12 percent. We just don't see that as forensic pathologists because there is so much background color from the normal blood that it's lost in that. So I would expect a pathologist, when there is substantial amount, to spot it relatively easily. But I would not expect somebody to see the lower levels that can still be um, a factor. And to do that, you would need to test the blood? That would be the, the gold standard, yes. Test the blood and see how much carboxyhemoglobin is in the blood. So if, if you're not saying um, that carbon monoxide caused Mr. Floyd's death, can you likewise eliminate it as a contributing factor? The only way to eliminate carbon monoxide as a contributing factor would be to ensure that there was none in his blood or a very, very low level in his blood. Um, so in Mr. Floyd, it robs him of an additional percentage of oxygen carrying capacity. Whether that be 5%, 10%, 15%, it takes away from the important factor of getting blood to his heart muscle. So this is just another potential insult, another brick in the wall, unfortunately, for um, the circumstances here. Now, ultimately, the officers weren't affected by this? No, they were not. And why would that, why could that be? Well, they're another two to three feet away, and potentially, uh, hopefully, they're much younger, and um, hopefully don't have heart disease. So, with every foot or more away, the amount of carbon monoxide in that particular bubble is going to decrease. Okay. Now, so we've discussed the heart, we've discussed carbon monoxide. Um, did you eliminate certain uh, causes of death as well? 
Yes. Specifically referring to asphyxia. Correct. How would you describe the investigation of custodial deaths compared to other types of deaths? Very long, very complex, and something that needs to be done very, very carefully. Are there many variables to consider? Absolutely, there are a huge number of variables, as we obviously um, can see in the case of Mr. Floyd as well. Now, in terms of uh, this article here in your uh, PowerPoint presentation, what's the significance of this? So this is a, an article that was put out um, I think about 1992 by uh, Dr. James Luke and Dr. Donald Ray. Dr. Donald Ray was one of the first pathologists to theorize that putting somebody in a face down position uh, was dangerous. And this was based on, on, on observations of cases where people were placed in a prone position and they died. And so his conclusion was <clears throat> that may well be a factor and needed to be considered. But what Dr. Ray also does say, and, and later on he recanted that um, to a large extent, but what he does say is that these are very difficult, complex cases. Don't rush to judgment. Make sure you've considered all of the potential issues that are at play in these particular cases. And I mean, they even talk about a crystal ball in this particular case. Um, and the risk of underestimating the importance of common sense and the fact that there are no easy answers in such deaths. In your experiences as a forensic pathologist, have you had the opportunity to uh, perform a death investigation and autopsies of in-custody deaths? Yes. So in this particular case, we've heard a lot about hypoxia. Um, which organ is more sensitive to hypoxia? The brain is the most sensitive, or rapidly sensitive, to hypoxia. In your review of the materials, did you have an opportunity to review some testimony of Dr. Baker uh, in prior proceedings? Yes. Um, Dr. Baker, in his testimony, referenced some studies uh, in terms of the effects of positional asphyxia. Are you familiar with those studies? Yes. Did you take those studies into consideration uh, as far as your analysis of this case? Yes, that, that is the current state of the science or the knowledge base with regard to this very difficult situation. So let's talk just simply about the prone position. Do people sometimes sleep in the prone position? Yes, approximately 7% of the adult population sleep face down. In terms of um, medical examinations, treatments, are people kept in the prone position? In certain situations, people are examined in the prone position. There are therapeutic maneuvers where people are deliberately placed in the prone position. Um, one of the best examples right now is COVID, where patients will be put in a prone position, which is face down, and it improves their ability for oxygen um, exchange, not decreases it. So, you know, the prone position by itself um, does not have, or at least there is no evidence right now that that is a significant issue. In terms of um, this particular case, of course, the prone position is, you know, not in a hospital setting, right? It's on a street, agreed? Correct. And I just generally, speaking if i were if a person were to lay down on the street in the prone position with nothing on top of them is that in and of itself inherently dangerous no the scientific studies basically have looked at the issue of the prone position with and without weight and made a determination that there really is no significant impairment of the individual's respiratory function and those particular studies were very carefully crafted. Let me, let me just interrupt you for a second, Doctor. Um, can you just, uh, what's the kind of the leading study on weight applied to someone in the prone position? I think there, there are several, but the one that um, I've recently read, well not recently, but I know of, is, is the one by uh, Dr. Mark Kroll 
and a couple of other co-authors. And is that this that paper here? Yes, I believe that is the one, yes. Positional compression and restraint asphyxia, a brief review? Yes. Now, in terms of this study, can you just explain this study? Um, can you explain the setting of the study, etc.? So this is a review paper where he refers to various papers, including his own work, um, where no evidence of any kind of compressional asphyxia was found in individuals who were in the so-called hog tie situation, which is prone, with their hands handcuffed behind their backs, additional restraints applied around their ankles, and then the two tied together. That is the classical hog tie position. And then weights were applied to the individual up to 102 kilograms, which is 225 pounds, and found, again, no significant um, disturbance at, to their ability to exchange and breathe. And so the final conclusion was, and there are about 23 different studies out there um, um, that Dr. Baker referred to in his previous testimonies and a previous legal um, such, um, environment. Um, and in this paper, Dr. Kroll says, positional asphyxia, as the term is used in court today, is an interesting hypothesis unsupported by any experimental data. So let me ask you, um, pursuant to the court's order, you were permitted to review the testimony or watch the testimony of other expert witnesses in this case, correct? Yes. And did you do so? Some of them, not all of them. Okay. Um, did you hear um, criticism of this Kroll paper? Yes, I did. And do you think that the study was flawed based on its methodology? So the study was asking one specific question. Is the prone position dangerous? When you craft a experimental process to look at a particular process, in this particular case was the prone, you want to eliminate all other variables. You want to eliminate fear. You want to eliminate exertion. You want to eliminate environmental conditions other than and focus entirely on that one entity. So agree that, that what is happening in this particular situation, you, they didn't use people who had heart disease. They used young, healthy volunteers. The surface they were lying on was not asphalt. It was a hard floor with a thin gym mat on it. The individuals were not in fear of their life. They knew that they could be pulled out of that at any time, and so there was no fear and hypersecretion of adrenaline and all of the other issues. All they simply were doing is evaluating just the prone position and the weight on the back from the prone position and found that it had no effect. So now you can go back and look at the other issues if you want to at some stage. Okay. Now, in terms of this study, by putting weight on the back, how did that work? So they were using um, bags of weight, sacks, and they continued to place them over the thorax, evenly distributed across the chest and an upper um, abdominal area. The area which is where your lungs and the so-called bellows, and so it puts pressure on the diaphragm if, because of the abdominal weight and on the chest and it looks to see whether or not individuals can still move air in and out, and they did not find any significant uh, impact. Have you ever um, seen a, uh, an image of like a team, a baseball team winning the World Series? Oh, you mean a, a human pyramid? Right. Yes. Is, that, is it kind of the analysis or analogy that they bring? Yes kind of lots of people piled up on top, someone's got to be at the bottom, right? Correct. Are there others, well, in terms of the Kroll studies, you, you talked about this particular study, are there, or this particular paper, that was a review of other studies, right? His own and other work, yes. And there were 23, I believe you said? Yeah, that was the um, testimony that um, Dr. Baker okay stated in the previous legal proceeding. So are these some of the other uh, studies that they reviewed? 
Yes, I mean, these, these are just a, a short list. It's not all of them. That's, again, just illust illustrative of the developing information. And really, this has gathered a lot of steam over the last couple of years. So prior to many of these studies, the wisdom of the position is dangerous was still accepted. But you can see from 2007, 2012, 2013, 2014, people are really beginning to look at this with a critical eye and really adding to the body of knowledge within the medical sciences and beginning to um, challenge some of these theories. Now, in terms of, I mean, again, just the research, um, the, com the, the criticism offered by previous experts was that it wasn't real world. Were some of these studies looking at real world situations? Correct. Which of those studies? So the real world ones are the two papers by Dr. Hall, I think probably are the ones that stand out. Um, the first paper was she took a, a city of 1.1 million. They weren't 1.1 million police restraints. It was a city of 1.1 million residents. And in that there were 1,296 cases where there was a forceful restraint. And the only death that they found in that particular case was a person who was not in the prone position. And they evaluated prone versus non-prone and statistically found no difference. That's a relatively small study. Um, so they went on and did a bigger study where they took four cities and looked at almost 5,000 consecutive um, force events um, and concluded, and their final conclusion was, concluded that their data support the human laboratory data, which are these ones that are in the controlled environment, that the prone position has no clinically significant effects on subject physiology. Now, did um, Dr. Kroll also publish a paper um, relevant to the weight of a police officer? Yes. And is that this study here? Yes. And um, can you just describe for the jury uh, this study by Dr. Kroll and others and the impact of an officer's weight being a factor in the analysis of prone position and posi positional asphyxia. So basically his conclusion was it doesn't matter how much the officer weighs. Yeah. 140, 150, 100 and, or 200 pounds doesn't really make a huge difference to the outcome. Um, what he did say is that with a double knee restraint specifically, it's two knees on the person, it has a modest influence on the weight applied to. Now these are not testing respiration, these were weight tests on dummies. So what he's measuring here is if a person weighs 140 pounds and they kneel on somebody, how much weight are they transferring? With a single knee, it didn't matter what weight the individual was. With a double knee, up to 23% of their body weight could be transferred to the dummy. Up to, I'm sorry, how much? 23%. So they were not looking. When, when you see it, um, it has an, a modest influence. It has a modest influence on the weight transferred, not respiratory activity. Okay. Um, do you know, based on your review of the materials, were you able to ascertain uh, Officer Chauvin's weight? I was informed, yes, and I've seen that weight. And what is that? 140 pounds is what I was told. Now you also, um, in reviewing the videos, you see that he has two feet on the ground with the exception of one small moment? Yes, that was w what I did actually see in the, in the video. So what portion of Mr. Chauvin's weight was transferred onto Mr. Floyd's body? He's using a single knee technique through the greater majority. His other knee is either on the bicep area or on close to the left chest wall. So single knee tech, it's going to be less than 23%. But even if he applied both knees, which he, he, would, have, he would have transferred 23% of his body weight for a 140-pound person, that would be between 30 and 35 pounds. 
um, less than 225 pounds from the yes. laboratory experiments. Yes. So in terms of, you know, let me ask you this first. Uh, in terms of the placement of Officer Chauvin's, excuse me, uh, knee to Mr. Floyd, is it your opinion that Mr. Chauvin's knee in any way impacted the structures of Mr. Floyd's neck? No, it did not. And None of the vital structures um, were in the area where the knee appeared to be from the videos. Now, again, in terms of your death investigations, um, you've reviewed photographs, you've reviewed the autopsy photographs, things of that nature, correct? Yes. Were any signs of, well, generally speaking, do signs of injury uh, play into your analysis as to the cause of death? Yes. How so? Well, you make an observation of such as in this particular case of a knee providing force to a particular part of the body and then you go and you look at the same part of the body to see whether or not you can I, find corroborating evidence within the body itself either an abrasion to the skin subcutaneous hemorrhage hemorrhage into the muscles or other injuries um, that may be caused by the knee and what injuries did you observe in the photographs of Mr. Floyd? All of his injuries were in areas where the knee was not. In other words, they were on the front of his body, um, his face, his places where he was restrained, but there was absolutely no evidence of any in injury on the skin to the subcutaneous tissue or the deeper structures of the back or the neck. Were there any uh, broken bones, spinal injuries, anything of that nature? There were no broken bones documented. Um, I did not see a description of the spinal cord in the autopsy report, but given that there was really no external evidence of the area, the muscles around the, the spinal column, um, I would be very surprised if there was any spinal cord injury um, in this particular case. So you referenced the, um, the back of Mr. Floyd. Did you see any bruising to the skin? I did not see bruising or abrasion to the skin. Did you see any uh, bleeding into the subcutaneous tissues of the neck and back? No, not on the autopsy photographs, nor was it documented in the autopsy. How about to the muscles? The same. And so in your opinion, the absence of such injury how does that speak to the cause of death? It speaks to the amount of force that was applied to Mr. Floyd was less than enough to bruise him. So in terms of um, the knee, can you, uh, I'm looking at your PowerPoint here, can you help us understand how the knee relates to questions of injury and force? Well, there are two structures that would be of concern in this particular case. One would be the actual knee itself, and the other would be the tibia, which is the shin bone. This diagram shows the shin bone, and this is this object right here. And if you remove that particular red circle that I just put in, you can see that the tibia has a relatively defined front edge right over here. Um, and you can feel it on yourself, but there's a, a nice ridge all the way down which is actually quite prominent and hard, and it's right underneath the skin. And so that allows an unforgiving surface such as the shin bone to be placed on soft tissues which are more vulnerable and cause some degree of injury to that area. So that's the shin bone. The knee is actually not that much different. The knee um, is somewhat spherical. You've got your patella and you've got the ends of the femur 
the thigh bone on either side and you've got the ends of the tibia just below all of which are bony prominences and again right underneath the skin and they can direct the, the amount of force if you put a substantial well, 30 40 50 pounds worth of force focus with your knee onto somebody in my opinion the chances of a subcutaneous or intramuscular hemorrhage is very very high and you didn't see that in this autopsy it was not documented and it's not visible on the autopsy photographs in your career as a forensic pathologist have you uh, looked at other strangulation type cases I've yes strangulation and other restraint situations where knees have been used yes do you typically see marks in those cases in manual strangulation often you will see hemorrhaging into the muscles of the neck um, and in cases where the knee has been used on the back we often see a bruise consistent and we, at times we have matched it to video cam footage of where we see a knee being placed, yes. And including just fingerprints, finger marks, I suppose. Yes, so just the pressure from somebody's fingers is enough to cause muscle hemorrhage in a manual strangulation case. We're not talking about a person putting weight on somebody, we're just talking about somebody squeezing a neck. When you look at this case and you see the knee is involved, the shin bone is involved, would you expect to see a greater likelihood of bruising from just the fingers? Objection, Your Honor, call for speculation. Over. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, um, in, in this particular case, where the knee is involved, there's allegations of it being used to, to force or subdue Mr. Floyd, would you expect the knee and shin bone to have a greater likelihood to produce bruising? Than fingers, yes. And is there any objective medical findings in the autopsy showing pressure placed to the back? No. Now, Again, we've talked about hypoxia, and we can take this down now, Judge. We've talked about hypoxia. Um, what are the effects of hypoxia that you would expect to see if that were present? So there are some observable symptoms when a person becomes hypoxic. Is that what you're asking, Councillor? Yes. Yes. What, what are those? So people typically start to get a little confused disoriented. They may have visual changes. People describe little spots of light, a gray curtain coming down. So there are visual abnormalities that people will describe and complain of. Um, they often become incoherent. They have difficulty in speaking. What is happening with hypoxia is your brain is getting progressively short of oxygen and so you're getting decreased function of your brain and some of those are going to um, mimic intoxication by other sources. Did Mr. Floyd, based on your review, complain of such visual changes? No. He complained of shortness of breath but there was no, no indication that he made any statements that he was having difficulty in seeing things. Is shortness of breath one of those things you'd expect to see in hypoxia? Yes. What causes that feeling of shortness of breath um, in, a, in a hypoxia situation? So again, when you're looking at hypoxic, hypoxia of the brain, which gives the, the person the sense that they need to breathe faster, breathe harder, they're short of breath and that can be caused by inability to get oxygen in or air into the lungs so an obstruction and or something that interferes with the airway or aff affects the ability to move the lungs so it can be respiratory or it can be cardiovascular and you can get shortness of breath with heart attack you can get shortness of breath with other vascular abnormalities so therefore there is, it, it's not a good discriminator. It doesn't help you separate out whether or not there was 
a respiratory problem versus a distribution problem of the oxygen. Because what you're looking at is air coming into the lungs and then the heart distributes it. And so if you have anything which interferes with the distribution of air from outside your body, to the, you know, absorption through the heart and getting to the, the brain, all the brain perceives is I haven't got enough oxygen and you get that sense of I am short of breath. And does you get that uh, same sensation um, from cardiac functions? Yes, I, I, I just mentioned that, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, in your review of the videos, did Mr. Floyd appear confused? He, not to my eye, not confused to time and place uh, and disoriented, no. Did you observe breathing patterns? Yes. How, uh, how would you estimate his breathing to, what was the rate of his breathing? I think my, my estimation was, was very similar to previous experts, about 20 to 25 um, breaths per minute. And if someone is experiencing hypoxia, do you, how, do you, how would that affect the rate of breathing? Typically when you're short of breath, you breathe faster and faster and faster. And is 22 to 25 breaths per minute considered uh, rapid breathing? It's faster than being at rest. And typically, I think at rest, we would be breathing at less than 20. But it's certainly not <clears throat> a, a rapid respiratory rate now. How about um, certain types of phobias? Yes. So, you know, if, if, if you have a phobia and you are pushed into a situation where you have to face the phobia, it's very stressful and it will fire up your fight and flight type situation. How would that affect the respiratory rate? Well, the moment you go into fight and flight and your adrenaline is surging, um, you're likely to start, um, as some people hyperventilate, there are lots of variables there. So again, in terms of that respiration rate, you would expect it to in increase well be of beyond the normal rate? Yes, I would not expect it to slow down. Okay. Um, in terms of the uh, placement of the knee and the neck, um, could you determine based on your review whether it appeared his airway was obstructed? Yes, the placement of the knee is towards the back and the back right side of his of Mr. Floyd's neck, and the airway is around the front. It is nowhere close to um, his airway. We were talking about um, having an open airway. How does that affect your ability to speak? The ability to speak or make any other sound, groaning, and Mr. Floyd did groan. So any of the sounds that Mr. Floyd is making requires you to be able to take air in over the vocal cords and out over the vocal cords. And so therefore, you cannot make sound unless you're A, moving air, and that your mouth is open and people can actually hear to some extent. I can hum with my mouth closed, but I'm not, it's, not, it's not effective. So the bottom line is moving air in and out is, and speaking and making noise is very good evidence that the airway was not closed. Okay. Now, in terms of, again, prior testimony, did you review or uh, watch the testimony of Dr. Tobin? I did not watch all of Mr. To or Dr. Tobin's um, testimony, no. Okay. Did you hear him discussing the hypopharynx? I did. And hypopharynx compression? Yes. Have you ever seen anything in the forensic medical literature um, that a compression of the hypopharynx can cause asphyxia? I have not. When you heard his testimony, what, did, what steps and efforts did you take to consider that? Started to do a survey of the available medical literature to ensure that I hadn't missed something. And I could not find... Objection, Your Honor. Sidebar. Overall, continue. I could not find anything in the forensic literature talking about pressure applied to the neck causing a hypopharynx... Objection, Your Honor. They disclosed. Overall. 
And then I went to the standard medical literature, and there are entities which cause impairment of the hypopharynx, but they are usually, well, they all were focused on foreign bodies being inhaled, such as hot dogs or some other object, and then also tumors in that area potentially blocking off that so structure. So nothing that really matched the testimony of uh, Dr. Tobin, as I understand it. Okay. In terms of um, hypoxia, moving back to that hypoxia, is hypoxia, the signs of hypoxia, is that a progressive or a fast process? Typically it can be both, but you have to recognize that there is oxygen in your blood that is there and it takes a while to use up that particular oxygen. So in most circumstances, the onset of hypoxia is gradual. If I restrict somebody's breathing and slow it down by some means or stop it by some means, there is still oxygen dissolved in their blood. You can hold your breath for 30 seconds with comfort. At 45 seconds, you're probably getting a little uncomfortable and you want to breathe. That's your innate reflex trying to override your voluntary suppression of your breathing. But you could probably go out to a minute before you start feeling woozy and or uncomfortable and disoriented and so that is the stored that's the heart continuing to distribute what you've got in your and so we see hypoxia occurring gradually in most circumstances over time it's not something which is an on-off switch and rapid and um as far as those symptoms that you see or would expect to see in a hypoxic situation, do they gradually progress like that as well? Typically, yes. Did you notice hypoxic changes in this particular case? No. Mr. Floyd was, was coherent and understandable until shortly before there was a sudden cessation of um, his movement. So if Mr. Floyd in this case was progressively suffering from hypoxia, what would you have expected to observe? I would expect him to, to become disoriented, confused, um, incoherent. Um, I would expect some of those symptoms to be um, at least somewhat apparent. And you would have, uh, would your review, in your review of the videos, would you have expected to see a progression in that hypoxia? Objection, Your Honor, ask and answer that. Please. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Understood. Now, how about asphyxia due to, uh, to position or compression? Let's talk about that. What is, what's, what cause, what does that affect? So there are certain positions a person can get into which impairs your breathing. And does that, what does that lead to? It leads to difficulty in moving your diaphragm and your chest and you know, impairing your ability to reoxygenate your blood. Can that lead to hypoxia? Yes. Which uh, bodily organ would you expect to see affected first? The brain. And all of those effects on speech and orientation and things progressing. Correct. But you described what you saw as a sudden change. What does that mean to, to your analysis? So Mr. Floyd goes from making clear statements. And some of the words I heard were please, and I'm short of breath, please, and then there's a period of about 45 seconds of silence, um, but he's still moving and seems to be um, active. And then there's a sudden relaxation. Um, and so he goes from pretty much fully functional um, and 
coherent to unconscious very rapidly. So in this particular case, how does his 90% blockage of the right coronary artery come into play? So what you're looking at there is a sudden decompensation, which is much more consistent with a sudden cardiac event. And what happens there is the moment the heart stops pumping sufficient blood, there is no circulation of blood. There is no circulation of the blood that still has some oxygen in it. And the brain will function for about 15 seconds, 10 to 15 seconds with full consciousness. After that, the person loses consciousness, but is not instantly dead. People don't suddenly stop breathing when they go unconscious. They will continue to, to breathe for a period of time, which can be as long as a minute or two, until the respiratory center in your brain shuts down. And at that stage, the person stops breathing. So in this case, can you just kind of describe the layers of factors that lead you to your conclusion that this was a sudden cardiac event? Yes. So we have a heart that's vulnerable because it's too big. It demands lots of oxygen. It has very narrow vessels. There are certain drugs that are present in his system that make it, put it at risk of an arrhythmia, the methamphetamine. There is another drug, fentanyl, which slows down your breathing, which will lower the oxygen, potentially, saturation in your, in your blood. Um, we've got the carbon monoxide, which has the potential to rob some of that additional oxygen carrying capacity. And then we've got vasoconstriction, so there are multiple, multiple entities all acting together and adding to each other and taking away from a different part of the, of the ability to get oxygen into his heart. And so at some point, the heart ex exhausted its reserves of um, metabolic supply and went into an arrhythmia and then stopped pumping blood effectively. Now, um, just a couple more topics to just cover with you, uh, doctor. Um, you did review the, well, in any death investigation, do you reveal, review uh, the role that uh, controlled substances play in death? Yes. Is, do you do that on a regular basis? It's a very important part of a forensic investigation and you know, most medical examiner's offices will try to get close to 100% toxicology analysis on their cases if suitable specimens are available. Now, in terms of the toxicology in this, uh, in this case, how would you characterize the role of fentanyl from the standpoint of forensic pathology? Not toxicology, forensic pathology. So fentanyl is a powerful narcotic. It's about 80 times more powerful than morphine. And the side effects of fentanyl are slowing down the respiration. So that impairs your ability to breathe as fast as you normally would. Does that result in increased, uh, or excuse me, decreased oxygen saturation? It would result in decreased air exchange, which would mean decreasing the oxygen in the bloodstream, but also not fully getting rid of the carbon dioxide, the byproducts of our normal metabolism, so slowly increasing carbon dioxide in his bloodstream. Okay. Now, um, again, within the context of forensic pathology, what does the presence of norfentanyl mean to you? Norfentanyl is a byproduct of fentanyl. Uh, it's a me metabolic um, byproduct. And so, in your liver, or in Mr. Floyd's liver, as the fentanyl passed through the liver, it was broken down into norfentanyl, which is the metabolic byproduct. It's the liver beginning to destroy and metabolize the fentanyl and remove it from the body system. Now, I'm going to, um, for the court, I have, uh, there are three slides contained within your 
um, PowerPoint presentation. I've independently marked them as exhibits 1059, 1060, and 1061. Um, I'd like to show them to the witness. Can you see that, doctor? Yes. Uh, would you agree that this appears to be a screenshot taken from the body-worn camera of Officer Lane at 20, 09, and 44 seconds? Correct. Looking at the second one, would you agree that this, again, appears to be a body-worn camera image taken at 20, 09, 45 seconds? Yes. And finally, uh, a third image at 20, 09, and 48 seconds? Yes. All right. Um, I would offer 2059, 2060, and 2061. No objection, no. And received. And our permission to publish 20, 1059. So in this image, uh, doctor, it's kind of hard to see. Um, what, in your review, did you determine whether there was the possibility that controlled substances were uh, ingested at the time of approach by officers King and Lane? Yes. And what do you see in this image, 1059, that is consistent with that? In the back corner of Mr. Floyd's mouth, you can see what appears to be a white object. Are you talking this object right there? Oops. Just slightly higher up than that, yes. Okay. Well, why don't you do it? Sorry, I covered it with the dot, but that's what I'm referring to. All right. You see, just underneath the dot. Now, in the next image, 1060, what appears to ha be happening? In this particular image, it appears that Mr. Floyd is looking away, <coughs> away from, excuse me, <coughs> um, from Officer Lane. And looking at the timestamps, that's approximately one second later. Yes. And in the third image, uh, does he appear to be looking at Officer Lane again? Yes. And do you see that same object in his mouth? I can, yes. You can. And so you be what does this lead you to conclude, or what did you strike that? Oops. We could do In terms of the uh, later analysis, there you understand there was evidence collected from the backseat of Squad 320? That is my understanding, yes. And do you know what that substance was? The, there was some material there that had saliva and DNA on it that matched Mr. Floyd, and those, I believe, and the, those objects had fentanyl and um, methamphetamine, if my memory serves me correctly. So is that what you conclude your uh, analysis on in terms of the ingestion of controlled substances as far as the timing in this case, both before they were approached as well as during in the backseat of the squad car? Yes. Now, how does the depression of uh, the respiratory rate, we may have covered this, I apologize. How does the uh, depression of the respiratory system, how does that affect the heart specifically? If the respiratory rate is decreased, the amount of oxygen that is getting into the bloodstream through the lungs is decreased. If I breathe slowly, I'm not able to get as much oxygen in my lung, into my lungs as if I'm breathing very rapidly. So anything which slows down respiration is going to affect the ability to oxygenate your blood. And 
Will that also work in concert with the coronary artery issues? It makes it worse. Again, anything which lowers his oxygen saturation in the blood will act again to restrict oxygen supply to his heart muscles past that blockage. How about the, you also understand that methamphetamine was found in the toxicology? Yes. And how would you look at the role of methamphetamines from, from the perspective of a forensic pathologist? So methamphetamine has three major factors. It can cause arrhythmias, it causes vasoconstriction, and it causes the heart to beat faster. Those are its three major physiological or pharmacological um, activities. And that would impair, again, um, an individual in Mr. Floyd's um, condition with his heart disease um, and put him at risk. Now, in terms of, again, the toxicology findings, um, in the, the fentanyl, there was the metabolite norfentanyl, correct? Yes. What does that tell you in terms of the timing of when Mr. Floyd may have ingested the fentanyl? It tells you at least some of the fentanyl was taken at some point previous, at some, t at some time before, that allowed for enough time for the fentanyl to be absorbed and then pass through the liver and some of it to be broken down. That doesn't happen instantaneously. It can take um, a period of time. And methamphetamine, does it have a similar metabolite? It has a metabolite, yes. And what is the metabolite? Uh, amphetamine. And um, based on your review of the toxicology in the case, was there amphetamine found? I did not see any amphetamine in the uh, reports. What does that suggest to you as a forensic pathologist relevant to the time at which Mr. Floyd would have ingested the methamphetamine? So that would be consistent with a recent ingestion of methamphetamine. And in, in terms of the phase of absorption or elimination, where would that place him? Um, well, if there's no evidence of elimination, i.e. metabolism from methamphetamine to amphetamine, um, it's not in the elimination phase. And given that there appears to be, there's none of that, he's still probably in the absorptive phase. It's consistent with the absorptive phase. And ultimately, those pills that were found in the backseat of the squad car, you understand that when Mr. Floyd was in the squad car, he was handcuffed. Objectively. What information did you have about um, Mr. Floyd's ability to ingest those controlled substances while he was in the squad car? He had his hands cuffed behind his back from the videos, and those were placed outside when he was taken out of his own vehicle. Um, I did not see any time when those were removed. Um, until such time as um, it, it, resuscitation was attempted. So the entire time he had his hands cuffed behind his back. Um, and therefore I cannot think of a, a plausible way that an individual would be able to get materials into their mouth while restrained in such a format. Now the last topic I'd like to discuss with you is um, the paraganglioma. Did I say that right? It is close. <laughs> All right. Um, can you just describe what that is? A paraganglionoma. <clears throat> so this is a tumor that was found at the time of autopsy um, down in Mr. Floyd's um, lower abdominal area. Um, and these are tumors. And they typically are of two types. One which is um, has parasympathetic or is similar to the parasympathetic part of your um, nervous system which does not secrete any substances or certainly vasoactive substances like catecholamine and then there are the sympathetic ones which have the ability to secrete. The parasympathetic ones tend to be found up in the head and neck area and the sympathetic ones tend to be found down in the lower abdominal area. Again, this is where Mr. Floyd's was found. What's the relevance of finding the paraganglionoma in this case? So these tumors have, 
at least the ones in the pelvic area, if they are secreting vasoactive substances, catecholamines is the correct term, they will cause an individual um, potentially to be hypertensive. So that's one of their baseline, if they have a low level of secretion. And the other thing that paraganglionomas do is every now and then, um, without warning, they'll have a sudden surge in secretion, so they're cyclical, um, which sometimes makes it difficult to diagnose them. You have to do specific um, testing to diagnose them to get around the cyclical activity. So in, just kind of in conclusion, doctor, um, did you form ultimately opinions as to the cause and manner of death of Mr. Floyd? Yes. And um, what would those conclusions be? Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia due to hypertensive atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease during the restraint. And were there um, contributing causes? Yes. What are those? The substances, the fentanyl and the methamphetamine, the potential of a um, carbon monoxide role, and the potential of the paraganglionoma was adding adrenaline to this whole um, mixture, uh, making things even worse. How would you classify the manner of death? So this is one of those cases where you have so many conflicting um, different manners. The carbon monoxide would usually be classified as an accident, although somebody was holding him there. So some people would say you could elevate that to a homicide. You've got um, the drugs on board. In most circumstances, in most um, jurisdictions, a drug intoxication would be considered to be an accident. He's got significant natural disease, certainly the heart, the paraganglionoma, you know, you can certainly consider it um, as a potential exacerbating process, but I wouldn't put it at the top of the list there. So he's got a mixture of that. Um, and then he's, he's in a situation where he's been restrained in a very stressful situation. And that increased his fight and flight type reaction and that would during restraint would be considered a homicide and you put all of those together it's very difficult to say which of those is the most accurate so I would fall back to undetermined now if uh, we in can, this particular case if we put uh, your slide regarding the undetermined manner again back up So essentially this, you, doctor, you would agree that this had lots of or many potential contributing uh, causes? Correct. And under the definition, the names definition of an undetermined manner, how does that apply? So that, that is what this classification under the name guidelines is really one of the one of the uses of this particular classic classification is when you've got so many conflicting different um, potential mechanisms of death that could lead to um, yeah so therefore the manner is not clear um, your honor I have no further questions members of the jury will take our lunch recess uh, we'll reconvene at 1 30 council remain for a short time And I think you may step down. Thank you for your insurance. Thank you.
All right, be seated. Uh, we did have a sidebar regarding one uh, objection by the state regarding certain testimony of this witness, uh, including lack of disclosure. Um, and we had not talked about this earlier. And so I wanted the state to know that in order to meet anything, we have experts who are watching each other's testimony. And this expert testified that he did certain things very uh, close to his testimony. I am allowing the state until tomorrow. I'm not going to make you come up with any rebuttal today. Even if we finish today with the defense case, I would allow the state to consider and call anybody in rebuttal to meet anything because I assume that Dr. Tobin or others might be listening. And so I would give, and that's why I overruled the objection is because even if it had been disclosed, I would have allowed it and given the state time to respond. And I will give you overnight so there's not uh, any prejudice to the state uh, if it was not disclosed. And that's my reasoning, Your Honor. Or for If you're saying, Your Honor, I really didn't get a chance to look at this report. What are you thinking? Uh, that's why. <laughs> I didn't want you to think it was personal. So, Mr. Blackwell uh, and Mr. Nelson, feel free to talk overnight in case there is a way, if there is rebuttal testimony, if we can uh, somehow make that <coughs> come in easily. Yes, Your Honor. Is, well, we won't get into that. That's your business, not mine. Uh, but I will allow you overnight to prepare any rebuttal. Thank you, too. Okay, thank you. See you at one thirty.
Dr. Cylinder. Thank you very much, Your Honor. <coughs> Mr. Blackwell, whenever you're ready. gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Fowler, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. I'd like to say I have a few questions for you, but I have more than a few uh, <laughs> this afternoon. Uh, let me just start with some basic questions just by way of sort of background of yourself as an expert witness. Uh, do you agree that as an expert witness, you should be objective, fair, and impartial as best you can? Yes, I would agree that that's appropriate as best you can. Uh, do you agree that in the background research you do to testify, that you should be thorough? Yes. Uh, meaning you should do your homework before you arrive at your opinion. Fair enough? Yes. I ask that question in part because uh, you asked a question about Mr. Chauvin's weight, and, and you understand that the relevance of Mr. Chauvin's weight to this case is how much weight he was putting onto the body of George Floyd beneath him. You understand that, don't you? Yes. You told the jury that Mr. Chauvin's weight was 140 pounds, didn't you? That's the information that I was provided, yes. Where did you get this information provided? From counsel. Uh, did, uh, in the information that uh, was provided to you, uh, were you not told that Mr. Chauvin was wearing equipment? That was not considered as part of the process. I would agree with you, Counselor. All right. So, <clears throat> you know he is wearing equipment, though. He's a police officer at the time, right? Absolutely. And so you didn't factor in the weight of his equipment that was also on the body of Mr. Floyd. Is that true? That is true. Uh, now, you agree that uh, as an expert witness, you shouldn't jump to conclusions. That is, you should reach fair conclusions based upon a careful, considered analysis. That is correct, yes. Uh, do you agree that you shouldn't come at this in a way that's biased? You agree with that, don't you? Absolutely agree with that, yes. You shouldn't cherry pick facts? No. You shouldn't try to confuse the jury? Correct. Now there's a reason I ask about that too. Because you spent quite a bit of time talking about carbon monoxide. You, you, you remember that discussion, don't you? I do indeed. Now, just going right to the punchline on carbon monoxide that you, you talked about at some length, you haven't seen any data or test results that showed Mr. Floyd had a single injury from carbon monoxide. Is that true? That is correct because it was never sent to I the just laboratory ask for you that whether, test. I asked you whether it was true, sir, yes or it no? It is true. Um, now, as you were talking about carbon monoxide, you were referring to the squad car that Mr. Floyd was near, weren't you? Yes. Uh, have you ever laid eyes, I don't mean pictures, physically, on the squad car that you were referring to? I have not. Do you know whether it has a single exhaust or a double exhaust? The information that I was provided, it has a double exhaust with twin exhaust pipes on each side, so it has four exhausts. Right. Now, did you know the make and the model of the car? It is a Ford Explorer Interceptor. Is it a hybrid? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, did you see any air monitoring data that actually would give you any information as to what amount of carbon monoxide, if any, 
would have been in Mr. Floyd's breathing zone? No, because it was not tested. It was a yes or no question. You haven't seen any, have you? I have not seen any data. And you didn't go yourself to try to do anything akin to air monitoring, uh, air sampling to simulate what Mr. Floyd might have been exposed to in proximity of a similar vehicle. You didn't do that, did you? Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, do you agree with me that there was no finding of carbon monoxide poisoning uh, from Mr. from Dr. Baker's autopsy review? I do. Uh, you mentioned an EPA standard of nine parts per million. Nine parts per million on an eight-hour basis uh, as the exposure limit for carbon monoxide. Remember that discussion? Yes. And you mentioned 35 parts per million, what I call a peak exposure, that is an exposure for a one-hour time period. That is correct, yes. Now, you are not now, nor have you ever been an industrial hygienist, true? Absolutely correct. I have not been. Now, the fact that um, OSHA, oh, I'm sorry, the EPA provides a standard of nine parts per million on an eight-hour basis. That's a time-weighted average, isn't it? Yes, that is your maximum exposure over that period, and you're allowed to do that once in one year. Uh, so it's a time-weighted average over eight hours. Uh, are you able to tell this jury <clears throat> whether or not Mr. Floyd, at the time that he was being subdued on May 25th, was being exposed to carbon monoxide above the limit or level that was set by the EPA of nine parts per million? No, no testing was done. Uh, for that matter, cutting even more to the chase, how do you know the car was even on? It was a question I specifically asked, and then I made an observation of water dripping from what appears to be a tailpipe. So if I ask you directly, uh, do you know if in fact the car was on or not? You didn't see any information or data from anybody who says I either turned the car on or I'm the one who turned it off. You didn't see either one, did you? Correct. And you just simply assumed by seeing something dripping from a tailpipe that the car had to have been on. It's not an assumption, it's an evaluation, which in my mind indicates that the vehicle was running. You, you mentioned carbon monoxide studies. Uh, these are outside studies that you're referring to. Remember those outdoor studies? They are referring to outdoor air, yes. Uh, you referenced a total of two studies, true? The carbon monoxide, which studies are you referring to? Counsel? I'm referring to the, the San Antonio study, I'm sorry, three. Well, San Antonio study, 
the DeMaio, and then the Polis study? So the DeMaio and San Antonio are one in the same. Okay. Dr. DeMaio was the chief medical examiner at the San Antonio chief medical examiner's office when he wrote that article. So then if we have the San Antonio study and then DeMaio are one study, that one study involved three people, didn't it? Correct. And then we have the study you told us about, the Polish study, that involved one person, right? Cor correct. Uh, can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how long were the subjects in those studies exposed to carbon monoxide? Do you know? It's unknown. Now, I had uh, another issue that I wanted to raise, again, under this heading of uh, the jury not being confused. And this relates to the white substance that you are referring to in the mouth of Mr. Floyd. Remember that discussion? Yes. And so it started with the white substance in his mouth, and I think it ended with talking about a partially digested pill in a car. Remember that? Yes, I do. Uh, I'd like to show you and discuss with you a couple of exhibits. Now you told us that you looked at surveillance uh, video from stores uh, in discussing the materials that you reviewed. Remember that? Yes, sir. And, and the store at issue here is Cup Foods. That was one of them, yes. So you recall looking at the surveillance video from Cup Foods? Yes. I want to review part of that video with you, uh, if I could. And uh, if we pull up Exhibit 29, I think it's in evidence. So I'm showing you uh, an excerpt from Exhibit uh, 29 uh, in the Inside Cup Foods. And I want us together to observe George Floyd. Yeah, 741 and then 42. You can go ahead and play it, Brian. And could you zoom in, on, uh, Mr. Altice, on George Floyd? And Were you able to see uh, that portion of the clip, Dr. Fowler? Yes, sir. Uh, were you able to see that George Floyd was chewing? Overall, if you have an opinion. I, I saw his mouth open and close briefly. Um, I, he could have been chewing. I don't know. Let's play it again, because I would like for you to know. <clears throat> it, it, was, it was fast, Your Honor, if I could. Do you need to see it again to render your opinion? Uh, from what I saw, you on it was too brief to. Do it again. See if that changes your opinion. All right, now I want to show you a still, a couple of stills. Uh, if, uh, Your Honor, I made a couple of stills from uh, this segment of the footage that I marked separately as Exhibits 812 and 813, and, uh, and I would leave their admission. 
Any objection? No, no. 812 and 813 are received. So if you put up uh, 812, right? And could you zoom in again on George Floyd? Now, Dr. Fowler, can you see a white substance in George Floyd's mouth there? I can. Uh, and doesn't it look remarkably similar to the white substance that you were talking about uh, when uh, you uh, were discussing the photograph with the gun pointed at him in the car when he was first approached by the police? Yes, it looks very similar. Uh, is it your understanding that when Mr. Floyd left Cup Foods, he went out across the street to sit in the vehicle? Yes. And next he was then approached by the police sitting in the vehicle, right? I believe he was first approached by the clerks from the store and then he was approached by the police mm -hmm. subsequently. So <coughs> would it be fair to say in order to say that the white substance in Mr. Floyd's mouth was a pill, in light of what you've seen, that would be jumping to a conclusion, wouldn't it? Specifically, when I testified, I said there was a white object in his mouth. That's all I could discern from that, and I remember saying that um, under direct. So you were not then either telling or suggesting to the jury that the white substance was a pill, are you? I never said it was a pull. I carefully said that I could see a white Dr. structure in his Dr. mouth. Dr. Fowler, could you just and, answer and my question? I did not want to classify it, if, and I didn't if classify If you just answer my question. Yes. You're not either telling or suggesting to the jury that the white substance was a pill, are you? No, I never did. One other thing, under the heading of uh, not wanting to confuse the jury. Uh, you had a discussion with Mr. Nelson about a uh, scientist, uh, Dr. Ray, R-E-A-Y, and the, uh, the statement you made, and, and you can correct me so I say it accurately, but it was to the effect that he had been critical of uh, prone positioning and his relationship to asphyxia, but that he had later retracted that opinion. Remember discussing that? Yes. Uh, now, the statement that Dr. Ray had retracted his concerns about the dangers and hazards of the prone position with respect to asphyxia, uh, that statement was in fact never withdrawn by Dr. Ray. Isn't that the real truth? He withdrew it and said that it was more of a risk to individuals who were obese, is my recollection of um, the course of events in Dr. Ray's um, history. Your Honor, I want to uh, uh, show Exhibit uh, 818 simply for um, identification purposes to discuss with the witness. So let me show you first. Uh, this is a, an affidavit from Dr. Ray. And if you look on the second page, uh, if you have that, Ms. Del Tis, um, do you see where he has signed it here and dated it? Donald Ray. Yes. That's the person you're referring to, right? Yes, Dr. Donald Ray. Uh, let's go back to the first page and see if he retracted this. So let's see the first paragraph, just so we see what this is about. Statement written by Donald Ray and sent to Charlie Miller in June of 1998. In the November issue of the Annals of Emergency Medicine, Chan et al. published a paper entitled Restraint Position and Positional Asphyxia. This is one of the studies that you were referencing earlier today. Isn't it? Yes. Um, if we go down, Brett, uh, two paragraphs to the I readily acknowledge. Here, uh, Dr. Ray is saying, I readily acknowledge the value of these studies, that is, Chan studies, in the San Diego case of Price versus San Diego, which had many other features besides hog tying and the restraint maneuvers used to control the victims. This has since been presented in law enforcement publications as my retraction of positional asphyxia as a cause of death with particular reference to hog tying. 
And let's look at the next paragraph. Here's the punchline, Dr. Fowler. Such is not the case. I still maintain that there are risks and hazards. I'm reading what it says, right? Well, the question is, what's the question? Uh, oh, the, the, the question is simply exploring what it is uh, that Dr. Ray, in fact, said on the issue of whether he retracted this statement. One minute to make sure there's a question after each uh, portion as to whether it's true or not. All right. M Mr. Uh, Blackwell, would you join us on the sidebar? Yes, yes, Ron. So if you could re-ask the question, just so we're clear. Yeah, sorry, Your Honor. So Dr. Fowler, I'd like to uh, explore with you um, Dr. Ray's response on the question of whether he retracted, retracted uh, his statements of concerns about, uh, the, about positional asphyxia uh, as relates to the prone position. Did uh, Dr. Ray says, you see here that such is not the case. Yes, I do. And do you see where he says, I still maintain that there are risks and hazards to restraint maneuvers, including hog tying, and each case must, must be evaluated to assess the presence or absence of respiratory restriction in light of the method of restraint. Do you see that? Yes, that's what's written in this affidavit. And, uh, and then one more <clears throat> point here he makes. If we can see just two paragraphs down, the point. He says here, do you see this? The point is that street deaths are much different than controlled investigations. Uh, do you see that? Yes. And, and so Dr. Fowler, does having seen this affidavit from uh, Dr. Ray um, change your opinion as to whether he had retracted his opinion of concerns about uh, positional, uh, the prone position as relates to positional asphyxia. So it appears that he hasn't completely <clears throat> withdrawn his um, his position. Um, but Thank he does you. go into um, some additional description, which is the paragraph above, um, which you didn't Dr. highlight. Dr. Fowler, you answered my question. And, uh, and if uh, there are other things that <clears throat> Mr. Nelson would like to bring out, he have an opportunity to. Um, thank you, Brian. Now let's talk for just a moment about your uh, areas of expertise. We, we know that you are a forensic pathologist, uh, sir, but uh, you're not a toxicologist or you don't have um, a degree in toxicology. That is correct. I'm not a toxicologist. And, and to be clear for the jury, as a, as a forensic pathologist, you don't treat patients. Correct. Uh, we have heard from a, a pulmonologist who's also a respiratory physiologist. You're not a pulmonologist or a respiratory physiologist. True? That is true. So you never uh, measured anybody's respiration, that is their breathing, as a part of your work as a forensic pathologist. No, um, I have not. You're not a cardiologist, obviously. No. Just by way of uh, just a couple of background things, you told us um, a good bit about your background, but, uh, but what year was it that you arrived in the United States? I believe it was 1991. Mm -hmm. And in what year did you retire? Uh, December 31st, 2019. You told us quite a, quite a good bit about the uh, forensic panel and uh, you're employed as a consultant by the forensic panel. Is that a fair description? Yes. 
Now, to be clear for the jurors so they're not confused, uh, the forensic panel is not a nonprofit, is it? No, it's not a nonprofit. Um, At least to the best of my ability, I don't know what they're classified at, uh, as, frankly. I, I do not know. So, uh, through the forensic panel, you earn a livelihood. So, it, it, it's not volunteer time for you, is it? No, I get compensated by the hour. And the forensic panel, then, is not a, a governmental body. Correct. It's an independent organization. It's a business. It's a medical slash forensic science practice, which medical practices are businesses, yes. It's a business. Yeah. So I'm going to talk with you a bit about uh, asphyxial deaths. It, it's been what we've been referring to as deaths caused by low oxygen. Uh, do you agree, Dr. Fowler, that uh, positional asphyxia is placing a, a person into a position that restricts their ability to ventilate their lungs or a position uh, where the head may be in such a, a position that uh, you can't keep the airways open. That is correct, yes. Uh, and then at the end of the day, uh, in positional asphyxia, what gets restricted is a person's ability to oxygenate, oxygenate their blood because of the position they're in, correct? That is correct, yes. Uh, doctor, there are, are two component methods of ventilating uh, the lungs. One is to move uh, your ribs, and the other is to be able to move your diaphragm. Is that true? That is true, yes. But the, the key thing uh, for breathing is that you'll be able to uh, expand your chest. If you can't expand your chest, you can't breathe. Correct. You need to expand the capacity of the chest cavity so that the lungs draw air in as part of the, the process. You know, I'd like to focus with you for a moment on the first uh, roughly five minutes uh, that uh, Mr. Floyd was under, on the ground uh, as part of the subdual and the restraint under uh, Mr. Chauvin. Um, did you analyze where Mr. Chauvin's knees were uh, relative to the positioning of Mr. Floyd's body in that first five minutes? I did review the positioning, yes. Would you agree with me that for over half of that time period, Mr. Chavez's left knee was on the neck and his uh, right knee is at times on the back and at other times on his left arm or pushed in against his left side. That is correct. Those are all the positions that I observed the knee in, um, the right knee, uh, during that period of time. And so Mr. Floyd then is uh, sandwiched in a way uh, between Mr. Chauvin on top and the asphalt pavement beneath it, right? Yes, if you... It's a yes or no question. Yes. Um, I want to ask you a, a question about putting pressure uh, on someone's neck, that is, if you're on uh, a person's back and you are applying pressure to the neck. Uh, doctor, do you agree uh, that if pressure is applied to somebody's neck in the prone position and the person is squeezed until they become responsive, and if that pressure is maintained for a minimum of four minutes, that can cause irreversible brain damage? because the brain may be starved of oxygen. Is that true? Once cessation of oxygen to the brain starts... Dr. Fowler, my question was, is it true? Would you please restate, restate the question? Yes, sir. If you apply pressure to someone's neck and squeeze until the person becomes unresponsive and you maintain that pressure for at least four minutes, you will cause irreversible brain damage because you will have starved the brain of oxygen. Is that true? 
correct. It takes four minutes of no supply of oxygen to the brain to cause irreversible brain damage. Now, if, if somebody dies as a result of the consequences of insufficient oxygen or low oxygen, uh, we know that when that person dies, they're going to die of cardiopulmonary arrest because everybody dies of cardiopulmonary arrest. Fair enough? Yes. And if a person dies as a result of low oxygen, uh, that person's also going to die ultimately of a fatal arrhythmia, right? Correct. Every one of us in this room will have a fatal arrhythmia at some point. Right, because that's kind of how you go. Yes. Um, So I want to talk about the, uh, uh, the role of sort of physical activity, struggle, if you will, um, on uh, the oxygen stores or reserves when somebody may be in the prone position. Do you agree that when somebody is involved in a uh, pretty vigorous uh, physical confrontation, they would certainly have what's referred to as an oxygen deficit? Yes, any kind of exertion you build up a degree of lactic acid and other metabolites that need to be removed from the body. And you know, The term oxygen debt is used more in the lay environment, but yes, you, you have some makeup to do. And because you're using up your oxygen reserves then? Somewhat, but it's also more generation of the metabolic byproducts from the actual um, activity as well. well. Would you agree that somebody with an oxygen uh, deficit who is involved in a vigorous physical confrontation would be more susceptible to positional asphyxia than would otherwise be the case? Do you agree with that? Yes. It would be more difficult for them to regain their, uh, to get rid of the metabolic byproducts of the um, activities that occurred before. And, and would you agree then that a person with an oxygen deficit or debt <clears throat> is more prone to any kind of asphyxia than a person completely at rest? Do you agree with that? Yes, a fully oxygenated person at rest would certainly be at no risk of, or not no, but a substantially lower level of risk of an arrhythmia compared to somebody who has been exercised hard. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Fowler, are you familiar <coughs> with a text known as Spitz and Fisher. Yes. Pretty big. <laughs> uh, this is a standard text for medical examiners, isn't it? It's certainly one of the recommended um, books that fellows in forensic pathology will review as part of their training, yes. And it's one you've uh, in the past referred to as a reliable text. Yes. Uh, it is uh, handed out to all forensic pathologists in training as just a standard text. Again, it's recommended that they use that as one of their references. And you aware that this, uh, this text on medical legal investigation of death, uh, it contains uh, sections on death by asphyxia, doesn't it? Yes. And do you agree uh, that for death by positional asphyxia, uh, that that is death caused by lower insufficient oxygen uh, that the causes for that may be what's referred to as endless. Yes, hence the complexity of these particular cases. So you, you spoke with Mr. Nelson about the fact that on, on autopsy when somebody dies of asphyxia or insufficient oxygen, you might see injuries to the ribs or uh, to the vertebrae uh, that indicate uh, the type of restraint or at least how the asphyxia came about. You might see that, right? Yes. Uh, you might see what we refer to as traumatic manifestations, uh, things like uh, bruises, evidence of injuries on autopsy. You might see those, right? Yes, absolutely. Do you agree, Dr. Fowler, that uh, the majority of cases where somebody dies of asphyxia are very subtle 
and in fact, no traumatic manifestations are visible at all. That is correct, depending on the circumstances. And what I mean by that is that there isn't necessarily any evidence, any physical evidence on autopsy of what it is that caused the low oxygen in the majority of cases, right? In a substantial number of the cases, I'm not sure it's absolutely the majority. Brett, could you? Let's get to page 828. Uh, Dr. Follett, can you see here from uh, represent, this is from Spitz and Fisher, uh, for identification purposes, uh, Your Honor, it's Exhibit 814 for the record. Um, am I reading here correctly that, however, the majority of cases are subtle, in fact, often with no traumatic manifestations at all? I read that accurately? Yes, you did. Um, thank you, Brett. Are you familiar with, uh, with a publication called Knight's Forensic Pathology? By Sir Bernard Knight, yes. And uh, that's another reliable authority for forensic pathologists, isn't it? Correct. Uh, did you know that, uh, that Knight's Forensic Pathology also has a chapter on uh, suffocation and asphyxia? That, yes. doesn't, that doesn't surprise you, does it? Doesn't surprise me, and I've seen it. Uh, and that is Exhibit 815, just for identification purposes. And I want to show you what's said at page 354. This is taken from Knights. Knights, it says, there are no truly distinctive autopsy signs of pure hypoxia, and most of the alleged criteria are caused by factors other than a lack of oxygen. Uh, did I read that accurately? Dr. Fowler? Yeah, I'm just reading it and tr trying to process it. I, I apologize. I'm oh, sorry. No, please. Take your time. Yes, that's what it says. Right. Now, you had some uh, discussions with Mr. Nelson about uh, strangulation. Uh, you do understand in this case that, that no one is contending that Mr. Floyd was manually strangled by anyone. You understand that, don't you? Oh, absolutely correct. There was no evidence of manual strangulation and no discussion of manual strangulation. Uh, Dr. Falder, do you agree that with respect to uh, positional asphyxia, uh, the diagnosis of posi positional asphyxia is one that is made by investigation because you won't find an autopsy finding that necessarily, specifically, tells you why the person is asphyxiated. Correct. The scene information becomes very important. Now you, you spent quite a bit of time talking about the prone position studies, uh, and I referenced them just a few minutes ago by Chan and others. Um, let me ask you a, a couple of other questions just about those studies and to try to correlate them to this case. Uh, is it true, Dr. Fowler, that none of the, of the prone restraint studies that you referred to actually studied uh, subjects who had someone's knee on their neck in the prone position. Is that true? That is true. Uh, none of the studies uh, went for as long as 9 minutes and 29 seconds. Is that true? That is true. So do you agree, uh, Dr. Fowler, that if the weight of several officers or a police officer is put on the actual torso and abdominal areas 
of a person, a person in police custody, that can cause compressional or positional asphyxia. Do you agree with that? If it exceeds the limits of 225 pounds, as found by multiple studies, then yes, your argument is correct. Could I show uh, Brad Exhibit 808 for identification purposes? Uh, let me ask you first, uh, you, uh, you did give a deposition uh, in a case that is called uh, Curtis versus Prince George's County um, a few years back. Do you remember uh, giving a deposition in a case called Curtis? Yes. Uh, and you've been involved in any number of depositions over your career as a forensic pathologist, haven't you, sir? Yes, sir. But in every one of them, uh, you took an oath that you would tell the truth uh, at the depositions, right? Yes. Um, so with that said, let's uh, look at your question and answer from this deposition. Question, what would it take a police officer, officer to do in that situation to cause compressional or positional asphyxia? Well, the compress compressional specifically would require the weight of several officers on the actual torso and abdominal area, something that is documented in the medical literature as burking. Uh, burking, which is a method of killing people that was made popular back in England in the Middle Ages when they were looking for bodies to teach medical students anatomy. Uh, did I read that accurately? Yes. Can we agree that when you answered, when you gave the answer to this question, uh, you did not say anything about an excess of 200 pounds or 220 pounds. Is that true? Uh, what I said would take the weight of several officers on the torso and abdominal area. That's exactly what I said. Sir, then. I just asked you if you made any reference to uh, having a weight that exceeds either 200 or 220 pounds. Did you make any such reference, yes or no? I didn't give a specific weight. I just said several officers. So we, we know here, uh, in this case, when Mr. Chauvin was on Mr. Floyd's uh, back and, and neck, uh, from time to time he was pressing down forcefully with his knee uh, also on the left arm. You saw the knee on the left arm from time to time, didn't you, sir? Yes, I did. Uh, I want to ask you in that uh, framework about another uh, quote from Spitz and Fisher. Uh, exhibit 814 for identification purposes on page 833. I'm sorry. 833. Contrary to the belief of some, it is our opinion that pinning down the shoulders or forcefully pressing down the arms is equivalent to loading the back. A struggling, agitated individual breathes faster, has a faster heartbeat, elevated blood pressure, and heightened metabolism. Such an individual requires more air and more oxygen. Immobilization of the chest, even if only partially reducing the ability to maintain vital functions, culminates in cardiac arrhythmia. Do you agree uh, with uh, the statement from Spitz and Fisher? No, um, specifically, I do not. They stated it, it is their opinion. Um, and again, this is a medical opinion um, expressed by those particular authors. It's not a scientific fact. Thank you, Brent. Uh, Dr. Fowler, do you agree that with Mr. Floyd in a uh, in a prone stomach down position with Mr. Chauvin applying some pressure to the neck and pressure to the torso in a downward position, that these forces would be symbiotic. Uh, they would actually add together. Is that true? Yes. 
I agree in the paper by Kroll, as I quoted earlier on, the single knee... Dr. Fowler, I just asked if it was true. Yes. Uh, Dr. Kroll confirmed that. And all those things together would make somebody more likely uh, than if those factors weren't present, it would make it more likely for them to succumb to asphyxia, correct? If the weight is sufficient, yes. You, you told us, uh, Dr. Fowler, that you had uh, been able to catch some of the testimony at the trial from some of the other uh, medical persons who testified. You didn't see all of it, but you've seen some of it. That is correct, so yes. Uh, are you uh, then aware that a number of uh, medical experts and others uh, have testified that uh, Mr. Floyd di died primarily uh, to the effects of low oxygen that arose out of Mr. Chauvin's subdual restraint and neck compression. Are you aware that, that a number of persons have testified about that? Yes, I am. I'd like to talk with you about uh, what specifically uh, you have done to actually assess what Mr. Floyd's actual oxygen reserves uh, would have been uh, during the subdual restraint and compression on May 25th of 2020 while he was uh, underneath uh, the, the body of Mr. Chauvin. Um, you wrote a report containing your opinions in this case and it is dated on February 22nd of 2021, right? Yes. I will represent to you and assume for purposes of my questions that end expiratory lung volumes or EELV is the amount of air that remains in your chest between breaths. Will you accept that as a premise for my question? The end respiratory lung volume? Yes, Is that what you're referring to? The EELV, yes. Yes. Um, and I'll refer to that commonly as simply the body's oxygen reserves, just as a common way to refer to it. And then? It's the air that's left in your lungs. It's not the body's oxygen reserve. Your major oxygen reserve is in the oxygen dissolved in your bloodstream. We'll just call it the EELV then, okay? Thank you. All right. Uh, do you agree that as the EELV decreases, that it takes more work to breathe? I believe so, yes. Incidentally, you were having a discussion, had a discussion with Mr. Nelson about the hypopharynx. You recall that discussion? Yes. Now, the report that you prepared in this case was 31 pages or thereabouts. Fair enough? Yes. Uh, can we agree that the word hypopharynx doesn't appear in your report in any of the 31 pages expressing your opinions, does it? That is correct. Um, now, you had made some comments uh, earlier uh, that uh, you couldn't find uh, anything in the, the literature about whether the hypopharynx uh, may be impeded by restraints on the back. Do you recall that discussion? Yes. And, uh, and I take it you went to look at forensic pathology studies in that regard, didn't you? I searched the general literature and forensic pathology um, sources, yes. Did you look actually in physiology journals, sir? That I would consider to be part of the general medical literature. So yes, you did look in physiology journals. I searched broadly for it. I don't know whether it's... I did not specifically focus on look in physiology journals only. Well, I don't want to confuse the jury now. Do you? No. Do, do oh. you? I'm sorry, Judge. Come to sidebar, please.
I'm sorry, you can restate the question. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Fowler, I was simply trying to get a, uh, a, a clear answer, if you can give us one. Do you have a specific recollection of actually looking at physiology journals uh, on the question of, uh, of the relationship between the, hy the hypopharynx and uh, the ability to breathe? I specifically did a PubMed search, which includes human physiology journals, and nothing came up on my search. So therefore, I did not read any physiology journals on this because nothing came up in the search. So Dr. Fowler, did you uh, calculate quanti quantitatively and include in your report what Mr. Floyd's EELV uh, was while he was sitting on the sidewalk uh, before the subdual and restraint began on the ground? No, I don't believe I did. Did you calculate and record the amount of air he took in with each breath at any point in time, either before or during the subdual and restraint on the ground? No. Did you do any quantitative assessment in your report for the time while he was sitting on the sidewalk uh, by the Dragon Walk, or whether his, uh, his breathing, his EEL, EELV, was either normal or whether it was abnormal? No, I did not. Uh, incidentally, if his EELV uh, was 89, that is 89 millimeters of mercury, uh, would you agree uh, that that would have been normal then before the time of this subdual and restraint on the ground? I typically do not do pulmonary medicine so the exact ranges of human beings are not something that I classically keep in my head so I don't know that number counselor when mr. Floyd then was uh, was uh, laid uh, uh, prone on the street um, when he's uh, face down did you do any calculations of what any reduction may have been in his EELV due to him being placed in a prone position no. When Mr. Chauvin had his knees on Mr. Floyd's back, uh, left arm and left side, did you do any calculations quantitatively for how that weight on the back would have had any impact on his EELV? No, I did not. Would you agree with me then that as the EELV goes down, uh, do you agree that as that goes down, it takes more work to breathe? That is my understanding, but I'm not a pulmonary um, physician. All right, so fair enough. For that, you would defer to a pulmonary physician. For more detail, yes. Well, let me ask you this, and, and you will tell me if I'm asking uh, the wrong person, Dr. Fowler. Uh, would you agree that pressure on the soft side of the neck also narrows the size of the upper airway, the hypopharynx? I have not seen any literature which indicates that that happens. That was one of the um, specific things I searched for. If you're correct, Councillor, it was not something that was put into the report because it's not something that I have ever heard of. And so I then went and looked for pressure on the neck causing restriction of the hypopharynx and my literature search was not fruitful. Thank you, Dr. Fowler. If, uh, if we might uh, show exhibit uh, 941, it's already in evidence. So showing you, Dr. Fowler, um, what has been entered in the, exhibit, in the evidence ex as Exhibit 941, uh, if we look at the left picture, we can see here, and I'll represent you this Mr. Chauvin who's uh, on top of Mr. Floyd. You can see here Mr. Chauvin's knee on the back part of the neck in the left photograph. Can you see that, sir? Yes. And then on the right picture, you can see that his knee is on the side of the neck, on the soft side. Can you see that also? 
Yes, on the back of the right side of the neck. Yes, sir. Thank you, Brad. And I think you referred to Mr. Floyd's death as a sudden death event. Um, is that the word you used? Yes, more sudden than prolonged. Um, if we fo focus on the, the first five minutes that Mr. Floyd is uh, restrained uh, on the ground, uh, you were able to see in the, that five minutes, first saw Mr. Floyd just struggling to breathe, right? I'll rephrase it, Yon. Uh, you, you could see uh, in the first five minutes uh, or here that Mr. Floyd was first calling out that he can't breathe. Correct. Mr. Floyd verbalized, I can't breathe multiple times. And uh, you then later heard him actually call out for his mother. Yes. And as time uh, passed in that first five minutes, you could hear that his voice got uh, thicker and quieter. You could hear that, couldn't you? I did not perceive that, but I'm no better at listening than anybody else is, so anybody can make up their own um, but, opinion with regard to that. But to your hearing, uh, you didn't hear any change in Mr. Floyd's voice. Is, is that what you're saying, sir? Not that I noticed. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that uh, during the five minutes that his words got further apart? Yes, they did. Uh, did you notice that after roughly four minutes and 45 seconds that Mr. Floyd went unconscious? Yes. Uh, then did you notice that sometime after five minutes uh, he was found not to have had a pulse? Correct. Uh, in your report, you refer to this as a, as a sudden death event, uh, but in your report and your findings, um, you don't record a time, do you, sir, for when the sudden death supposedly occurred, do you? I don't specifically remember doing that. Um, correct. So if we look at this uh, continuum from hearing George Floyd calling out that he can't breathe to the point that it doesn't have a pulse over that five minute time period, is it fair to say that that is what you're referring to as a sudden death? No. All right. Then, all right, I asked you the question about when the sudden death occurred. Uh, where in this spectrum, then, it's okay if you don't know the specific time, but where in this continuum did the sudden death occur from the time he is on the ground saying he can't breathe to the point in time he's found not to have a pulse? Are you able to generally characterize where the sudden death took place? So... What you're referring to as a sudden death, and I may, may well have misinterpreted, I'm referring to as a sudden cardiac arrest. There's a difference between death and cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is not absolutely irreversible and not synonymous with a, a person always passing away. Um, so there's going to be a period of time between his cardiac arrest. For instance, in this particular case, the official pronouncement was done in the hospital. Frankly, he was dead long, long before that. But the moment of death is not something that you can easily document. So when we are in this space where there is a space uh, between cardiac arrest and between the actual death, are you uh, suggesting that though Mr. Floyd may have been in cardiac arrest, there was a time when he may have been revived because he wasn't dead yet. Immediate medical attention for a person who's gone into cardiac arrest um, may, re may well um, reverse that process, yes. Do you feel that Mr. Floyd should have been given immediate emergency attention to try to reverse the cardiac arrest? As a physician, I would agree. Um, are you critical of the fact that he wasn't given? immediate emergency care when he went into cardiac arrest? Yeah, as a physician, I would agree.
When you were observing the uh, the the footage of uh, of Mr. Floyd after he's gone unconscious, there's a point in time where you uh, see his legs uh, raise up. Uh, do you recall seeing his legs raise at the point after he was unconscious on the ground? Yes. Uh, was that leg raising? Was that consistent with uh, what's known as an anoxic seizure? That is what we would typically call it. Yes. And an anoxic. Uh, seizure typically represents uh, that there has been some uh, damage to the brain stem due to insufficient oxygen, true? It's a anoxic, or in some cases we would call it hypoxic seizure, and it's not damage to the brain stem. It means that the part of the brain that um, governs our actual muscular movement, which is the higher portion of the brain, is not functioning properly. So typically people with seizure disorders who have seizure activity, it's from the motor cortex and not from down at the brainstem. If you've damaged the brainstem at that particular stage, um, the person is effectively going to be deceased. Mm. So, but it's fair to say when we see an anoxic seizure, uh, at the very least, uh, we, we know that the brain is suffering from insufficient oxygen. Yes. Um, do you agree that uh, low oxygen in the body, insufficient oxygen, it can cause brain injury, can't it? Absolutely. And it can also result in PEA, pulseless electrical activity, true? True. Now, Mr. Floyd had a PEA, a pulseless electrical activity arrhythmia, when his body was taken away from the scene on May 25th, 2020, didn't he? Correct. Uh, is it true, Dr. Fowler, that the most common cause of a PEA is low oxygen, insufficient oxygen? To the brain? Yes, sir. Yes, which can also be caused by a cardiac standstill. So no oxygen to the brain from either mechanism will cause PEA. I had uh, a number of questions. I'm kind of thinking through them. I'll just ask you this. Uh, I had a number of questions that have to do with whether you did any sort of quantitative measurements about Mr. Floyd's uh, oxygen levels, his EELV, at different points in time, including at what point in time do you think his oxygen stores were completely depleted? I take it, Dr. Fowler, if I have any questions about quantitative measurements about Mr. Floyd's EELV, those would not have been measurements that you would have undertaken for any reason, right? Correct. And to the extent we are looking for such measurements, better to ask either a pulmonologist, a respiratory physiologist, uh, but not necessarily, well, not uh, Dr. Fowler as a forensic pathologist. Fair enough? Fair enough, forensic pathologists do not typically look at living people who are breathing. By the same token, if um, I had a series of questions about measurements of the carbon dioxide levels in Mr. Floyd's body after he ceased to breathe, between the time that he ceased to breathe and before the time he was given oxygen, when he was uh, picked up and given medical care and uh, taken to uh, Hibbe County Medical Center, you didn't do any quantitative analysis, did you, uh, as to the carbon dioxide levels in Mr. Floyd's body uh, in between the time he ceased to breathe and then the time he would receive uh, assistant oxygen? No, not specific quantitative analysis, no. Now you had quite a, a discussion about the paraganglioma. Uh, remember that discussion? Yes. Uh, do you know we had a uh, witness who testified who refers, it to, refers to it as an incidental moment? You ever heard that expression before? Yes. Uh, now, you talked <clears throat> about the, the paraganglioma 
uh, potentially uh, being an issue uh, if it were uh, secreting adrenaline, right? Correct. 90% uh, of paragangliomas do not secrete adrenaline. Is that right? Is that right? I think that's probably correct. I don't have that number in my head, but I have no reason to disbelieve that. Now, you're not telling uh, the, the jury, are you, sir, that Mr. Floyd died from a paraganglioma, are you? No. And although Dr. Baker did identify the paraganglioma on autopsy, he didn't uh, perform any test to determine whether it was a secreting tumor, that is, secreting adrenaline, did he? Correct. The only way to test those particular tumors is there's two methods to test. One is to do a blood test, and if the paraganglionoma is one which is constantly secreting, you'll pick it up on a blood test. For those paraganglionomas that tend to be cyclical, if you do a blood test and you happen to pick it up at the bottom of a cycle, it won't show. And so in some cases, the first test is to do a blood test. If it's positive, you've got your answer. If that blood test is negative, you then go on to do a 24-hour urine catecholamine screen, which will pick up the surges and the dips. And that is then you know, the second test that would be done in these cases. Neither of them were done. Just, doctor, just for clarification, is it, is it pronounced paraganglioma or paraganglionoma? Yeah, I, always, I often add in the extra vowel, so it's a paraganglioma. Paraganglioma, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Fowl. Uh, now, is it true that in all the world literature, there have only been six reported cases of people who have died from a sudden heart event from adrenaline release from a paraganglioma? Is that true? That's what the literature says, um, because in many cases it may go completely unrecognized. I just asked if it was true, Dr. Yes, that's Fowler. what's in the literature. Uh, now, one of the signature hallmarks for a paraganglioma is a headache, right? If it is one that does secretion at surge and then dip and surge. So if it's one that constantly secretes a small amount, um, it will not cause any symptoms at all. But to the extent, uh, well, we know that amongst the various complaints that Mr. Floyd had about pains, he never did complain about a headache, did he? I seem to remember at least, I seem to remember one admission where he complained of a headache, but I, I'm going from memory now, and, you know, I am not sure. And here I'm referring to on May 25th of last year, uh, you have a recollection that Mr. Floyd complained of a headache? I know he complained of tooth pain and a few other things, but I can't be sure that he did not complain of a headache. I do not have a clear recollection, right. Councillor. Right. I won't hold you to that, then. Thank you. So, Dr. Fowler, you, you, had, you asked some questions about Mr. Floyd saying, I can't breathe, before he was put on the ground uh, during the subdual and the restraint. Uh, do you recall that discussion? Yes. Uh, were you able to see what was happening with Mr. Floyd as they were trying to get him into what's referred to as Squad 320? Yes. Uh, were you uh, aware of whether or not Mr. Floyd was experiencing being choked as he was being put into the back of squad 320? I did not see a limb around his neck from my recollection. That's not something that I noticed. Your Honor and Counsel, I have a, a couple of stills from Exhibit uh, 43 that's already in. And uh, these are numbered Exhibits uh, 281 and 282. And 
and uh, and I would offer those uh, stills from uh, Exhibit 43 already in evidence. Any objections? Three, two, one, two, three, two, three, two. Yes, sir. May I go? Just yeah. Okay. 281 and 282 are received. Thank you, Your Honor. So we could first, uh, Brad, if we could show 282. Can you see here in, the, in 282, this area? Do you see where I've circled, uh, Dr. Fowler? Yes. And do you see this arm that is around Mr. Floyd's uh, neck? Yes. Do you recognize this person to be Mr. Chauvin? It appears to be, yes. And if I could show you uh, 281. I'm sorry, Don, if you could. And here we see the top of Mr. Floyd's face. And then there's a hand here on his neck. Do you see that? Yes. Um, And so you, uh, these weren't images or uh, scenes that you had paid special attention to before as you looked at what was going on in Squad 320? You had not uh, seen any arms or anything around Mr. Floyd's neck? No, I'd seen these particular sections. I'm sorry if I misinterpreted your question. You said before he went into Squad 320. I apologize if I misinterpreted your question. And so do you know whether when Mr. Floyd was um, into the back of Squad 320, and, and before he's pulled out, whether he complained about being choked, did he say, I'm getting choked? I believe he did, yes. And it doesn't take a medical uh, doctor such as yourself uh, to know that if somebody feeling that they are getting choked, uh, well, that would be a good reason why they would say they can't breathe. Yes. I wanted uh, Dr. Fowle to see if you could just clear up a couple of things for me just in the timeline um, of what happened uh, with respect to Mr. Floyd uh, and restraint on the ground. Um, was the, the leg extension, uh, the anoxic seizure as we've referred to it, was that before he lost consciousness or was it after he lost consciousness? After. Okay. And did you make a, a, a note of when Mr. Floyd's, wh when was his last vocal sound? Um, do you remember? Somewhere between a minute, 45 seconds and a minute before, I've got the information written down somewhere, before he, went unconscious was about the last time that he actually vocalized. If we focus in on the, the period of the uh, subdual restraint and the neck compression, um, was there uh, ever a time when, during the nine minutes and 29 seconds, where you saw Mr. Floyd either uh, sleepy, unarousable, or anything that's akin to being in a coma? So from the period after he has those hypoxic seizures? Or from the, from the time he's first put on the ground, that he's pulled out of the car, squad 320, he's subdued and restrained on the ground, Mr. Chauvin is on his uh, neck and back. Um, did you ever see uh, Mr. Floyd at any time uh, manifest either sleepiness, a lack of awareness, that he wasn't arousable, or that sort of thing? No, not until he lost consciousness. And, and typically, doctor, when somebody uh, passes away from a fentanyl or opioid overdose, one of the hallmarks of that is that they are uh, very sleepy and they will tend to be unarousable and uh, pass away in essentially a coma, right? 
Correct. If they are passing away from fentanyl overdose, that's what happens. And Mr. Foy was manifesting none of those outward symptoms, was he? On the Correct. Ground. It does not exclude the fact that it was still having a depressive effect on his respiratory system. Well, before he lost consciousness, uh, his respiration rate, I think you told us, uh, that you agree with Dr. Tobin, was somewhere in the ballpark of 22 breaths a minute, right? Correct. That is normal, isn't it? Yes. If fentanyl was affecting his respiration, then you would expect it a respiratory rate that would have been appreciably less than 22 breaths a minute if it's depressing his uh, respiratory system, right? Unless he should have been breathing at 30 at that particular stage because of his exertion and other stressors. And you have no really basis or baseline uh, to suggest uh, that Mr. Floyd should have been breathing at 30 instead of the normal 22, right? A person who is getting short of oxygen to their brain will often increase or usually increase their respiratory rate to more than 30. I want to talk with you a bit about the, the methamphetamine. Um, first, let me clear up, uh, if I can, this issue of, um, of pills again in the car on May 25th. Uh, when Dr. Baker performed the autopsy, uh, isn't it true that there weren't any pills found in Mr. Floyd's stomach? Correct. Dr. Baker did not identify any pill, tablet, call you what, what you want, um, residue within the stomach. And obviously any pill that's found in a car is a pill that's not in Mr. Floyd's body. Correct. Whatever the residual amount in those tablets was, was not in his body. Now, I think you made a statement uh, with respect to the, uh, the methamphetamine that it was not accompanied by uh, a metabolite uh, commonly seen if the meth had been in the system for um, an, an appreciable period of time. Yes. And I want to kind of be clear on this. Um, Have you, uh, since uh, making the statement in your report, learned that in fact the metabolite of methamphetamine, that is amphetamine as the metabolite, was present in uh, Mr. Floyd's uh, bloodstream from the toxicology results? I have heard a statement to, to that fact, yes. Um, did you investigate the statement to determine whether or not it was true? Yes. And did you find uh, that contrary to what you had written in your report, you in fact found that the metabolite of methamphetamine was present from the toxicology results for Mr. Floyd? In very low levels, so it did not change my opinion. Well, the methamphetamine itself was only present in very low levels. Isn't that true? That is true. And so if there's not a lot of meth, then there won't be a lot of the metabolite either. That makes sense, doesn't it? Correct. And or again, substantial amount of whatever methamphetamine is there has not yet been metabolized. So what was the level of methamphetamine that was found in this toxicology results? Do you remember? Not offhand, no. Um, how about 19 nanograms per milliliter? Does that sound right? It sounded right. I did not want to say it because I did not want to <laughs> be inaccurate. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. Uh, 19 uh, nanograms of methamphetamine is within the range uh, of what you would see in a patient whose doctor prescribed a therapeutic dose of methamphetamine, true? That is true if methamphetamine is used in a therapeutic environment.
You ought to have just one second. So last question, Dr. Fowler, then I will sit down for now. Um, I wanted to, again, just address the timeline from your report. And uh, I will um, read it to you, and my question would be whether or not this is the timeline that you, uh, that you still you stand behind, if I may. So at 8.24.09, the last Audible vocal sounds identifiable as Mr. Floyd's are heard. Soon thereafter, voices from bystanders tell police he is not breathing. Mr. Floyd exhibits extension movements of right lower extremity at 8.24.21 and movements of his right arm at 8.24.33. At 8.25.16, Mr. Floyd appears to have passed out. So, representation from your report, is that your best knowledge and information, sir? That's the information I extracted at that time, yes. And you stand by that too at this time, correct? I have no reason to disagree with that at this time now. Yeah. Dr. Fowler, thank you. Should we break at this time or can you be brief? Break? Yeah. All right. Break. Break. We'll take our 20 minute break. Uh, let's try and think about 10 after.
Okay, if you're still in the room. Good afternoon, sir. A few follow-up questions, Dr. Fowler. Um, first of all, you were asked a series of questions about um, the weight of Mr. Show, correct? Yes. And w how you obtained that information? Correct. And whether you took into consideration the weight of Mr. Chauvin's uh, e equipment and body-worn armor and things of that nature? Correct. To your knowledge, have you ever been provided with any actual weights of what a duty belt, its accoutrements, its the body armor actually weighs? No. Have you ever, to your knowledge, in the materials that you re received, did the state of Minnesota ever conduct any such weighing experiments? None that I saw. And you were asked those questions relevant, would you agree, relevant to the analysis of positional asphyxia, correct? That is my understanding, yes. Now, you would also were asked a series of questions about the um, bruising, things of that nature that you would see or like anticipate seeing uh, in these types of cases, right? Yes. Would the amount of weight that a person have, in your opinion, increase or decrease the likelihood of seeing such abrasions, whether it be below the skin or in the muscles? The more energy that is applied to that particular part of the body, the more likelihood there's going to be an, an injury. And the heavier the person, the more likelihood there's going to be more energy. So yes, heavier people are more likely to cause injury to an individual. And in your uh, practice, uh, whether it be as a the pathologist, or excuse me, the, the chief pathologist in Maryland, or through the forensics panel, or any of your other private endeavors, have you ever reviewed cases of positional asphyxia? Yes, numerous. And have you seen those types of injuries in other cases? Objection, Your Honor, is ask and answer them. Overall. Yes, I have. And do you, in those cases, did you have the luxury of comparing it to body-worn cameras and things of that nature? No. I mean, body-worn cameras are a relatively new uh, source of information for us. Um, for many years, we were restricted to, to statements. You were asked a series of questions about what type of testing you uh, performed relevant to the CO2. Do you recall those questions? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, you testified that your report was submitted on February 22nd of this year, correct? Correct. Uh, did your report that you prepared include your assessment involving the potential for CO2 in, or, or carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide in Mr. Floyd? Yes, it did. Since February 22nd, have you been provided with any uh, tests, experiments, any information that the state of Minnesota did similar types of testing? No, I have not been provided with any such information. But since that time, were you provided with photographs of the bottom of the squad car 320? Yes, I was. Has that been since this trial has started? It, yes, it's been within the last couple of days, to the best of my recollection. You were shown a couple of photographs of Mr. Floyd in a brief blurb, uh, while he, a video blurb while he was in the uh, Cup Foods store and asked to see what, if there was something in his mouth? Yes. And can you say that what that was with any specificity in his mouth at that time? No. Can you say that what was in his mouth in Cup Foods was the same object you saw in his mouth in the in his vehicle when Officer Lane approached him? No. Would you agree that at the, the drugs that were found in squad car 320, to your knowledge, contained Mr. Floyd's DNA? Objectively. Uh, sustain, rephrase. 
What do you know about the drugs that were found in the back of Squad 320? There were white, what looked like tablet re remnants, and they were tested for Mr. Floyd's DNA, and I believe they were also tested for his saliva, for saliva. And they were positive for both. And those were methamphetamine and or fentanyl? Yes. Do you recall, again, whether Mr. Floyd was handcuffed while in the squad car? Yes, I did not see him have his handcuffs removed at any time until such time as resuscitation started. And that's the period all the way from when the handcuffs were first applied to him outside his own vehicle. Immediately in the sort of the door frame of the vehicle? Yes. In prior to that point, at any point, did you see any videotapes of Mr. Floyd going into Squad 320 prior to the police being present? No. No. Now, you were asked um, a series of questions about an affidavit that was prepared by Mr. Ray, or Dr. Ray, I should say, back in 2005. Had you, I mean, were you familiar with the intricacies of this particular litigation? No, I'd never seen that affidavit before, and I have no idea what the litigation was about. you have any idea as to the context of this document? No. Now, you, you were asked a, about a couple of uh, paragraphs where he does, apparently does not retract his position on positional asphyxia? Correct. And you, were at, you skipped over, or you were asked to skip over a couple of other uh, paragraphs as well, correct? Yes. Would it refresh your recollection to review the affidavit uh, and put his statements within the, con the proper context as you view them? Yes. My approach? Yeah. Thank you. Does that refresh your recollection? Yes. What was the context of those statements? Well, the, the, the context is, is not specifically stated as to why he was making this statement. Okay. Were there other statements that he made that you found important? Yes. What were those? There was one here which says, a 280 pound man with a large abdominal paniculus, i.e. protuberant belly, um, is at risk in the face down position, as well as a person with obstructive pulmonary disease. And there are many shades in between. And so Don Ray, or Dr. Donald Ray, never retracted his opinion as to obese individuals. But he did, at, at one time or another, state that the average person who is muscular um, and not compromised in any way would have no risk. And that was in relation to the Chan studies out of San Francisco? Right. And, and then if, if he then goes on to say, not enough is known to say whether or not a method of restraint is free from any potential lethal effects. Basically not enough known. There wasn't enough information. Correct. You were asked a series of questions about whether you're a pulmonologist or a toxicologist, etc. correct? Correct. You're a pathologist, correct? That is my training and expertise, yes. Do you treat living patients? No. How did the patients that you observe appear to you? They are deceased. Are people, you, you were... Um, asked a series of questions about your work with the forensic panel, whether it was a non-profit organization or whether it was some uh, volunteer time. 
Do you recall those questions? Yes, I do. And it was forensic panel is a business, correct? Yes. Fair to say. Um, are, would you change your opinion simply by virtue of the fact you are being paid? No, not at all. Are people who volunteer their time more trustworthy in your experience? A projection, Your Honor, for the relevant. Sustained. You were asked a series of questions about a, a four minute time period result uh, where pr applying pressure to the neck, maintaining it there for four minutes would cause irreversible brain damage. Remember those? Yes, that was a very specific question. Can you expound on that a little bit more? What t types of variables might affect that? Well, basically anything which stops blood getting to the brain for four minutes will cause irreversible brain damage. Not just a asphyxial process, but a process where the blood has stopped being pumped to the brain. So if the heart stops, stops circulating blood, stops processing oxygen to the brain, four minutes, irreversible brain damage. Yes, well, for whatever reason the brain stops getting oxygen, after four minutes, the current medical literature considers that there is a high likelihood of irreversible damage to that brain. Do you recall that question that uh, counsel asked you specifically relevant to the position of Mr. Floyd or Mr. Chauvin's knee? Yes, he did. Based upon your review of the uh, video in this case, did you observe Mr. Chauvin's knee obstructing the carotid artery of Mr. Floyd? That knee did not obstruct either carotid artery. And even if it had obstructed one, the carotid artery on the other side, plus the two vertebral arteries, would continue to supply the brain with enough blood for it to function. Okay. You were also asked a series of questions on cross-examination about traumatic manifestations and the frequency with which you may expect them, correct? Yes. And I believe in this regard you were shown uh, some language out of a Spitz and Fisher book. Yes. Um, when was that Spitz and Fisher book published? I did not see which edition it was. Okay. There have been five editions. so. That I don't know. And the other thing there was the wording was different. It, it said often no signs of physical, not usually, which was my recollection of the question. And again, I apologize if I misheard the question. But so there are cases where you may have a positional asphyxia case that does not show these traumatic manifestations. Agreed? Yes, absolutely. Would you ag agree likewise that there are cases of positional asphyxiation where you do see these traumatic manifestations? Yes. And in your experience uh, with these types of cases, is it common to see bruising, petechia, things of that nature? It is very common. Now, uh, you were asked a question about whether or not any of the studies on positional asphyxia and prone restraint uh, ever reviewed a, a nine minute and 29 second time period. Yes, the laboratory studies. Um, are you familiar with the cardiopulmonary effects of physical restraint in subjects with chroni chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in the Journal of Clinical Forensic Medicine. Yes, I think I have, I, I believe I read that article. Would it refresh your recollection to just review it briefly? Please. May I approach?
Yes, I believe that I have actually seen this particular paper on individuals with chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Does it include I positional it. prone positioning greater than ni nine minutes and 29 seconds? Yes. You were asked a couple of questions about a deposition testimony you gave in Curtis versus Prince County. Do you recall that? Yes. Fair to say that was one small portion of a larger deposition testimony? Yes, and the reference to Birking kind of cut off the second part of Birking. What is Birking? So it's a process where somebody would sit on somebody's chest to restrict chest movements at the same time somebody else would be applying another method of um, asphyxia to them, often suffocation. And that was in order to basically get cadavers? Or yes, it, they, they were um, doing, they were in the business of obtaining cadavers for, for medical study. And they wanted people that didn't have any significant injuries. This was a method by which these two individuals figured out they could kill people without leaving any marks on them and then sell the cadavers for, for medical study. Gotcha. And I believe, and I don't have, unfortunately, the transcript uh, accessible on the computer, but I believe you referenced multiple officers or something to that effect being on the actual torso, correct? In that particular case, yes. You were asked a series of uh, questions. Let me ask you this real quick. You were asked a question about um, Dr. Baker's finding at autopsy relevant to the stomach contents. Yes. To your knowledge, were the stomach contents ever tested or analyzed for any toxicological substances? I never saw any reporting on the stomach contents being analyzed in a laboratory for any substances that may be present. And if Dr. Baker testified that his office maintains those samples for other doctors, other people to review, um, are, have you been made aware of any tests that were conducted subsequent to Dr. Baker's autopsy on the stomach contents of Mr. Floyd? I'm not aware of any studies um, that were done on, those, on that material. You were asked again a series of questions about EELV, and there was a question about the oxygen reserves. Do you recall generally? Yes. Um, in terms of the oxygen reserves, where in your, uh, based on your experience, is the main oxygen re reserve stored? The main oxygen reserve, in my opinion, is within the blood. It's the dissolved oxygen that's already attached to the hemoglobin and that will continue to circulate around the body for a period of time. What is in the lungs is part of the exchange process. I would not call that a, an oxygen reserve. Now, in terms of this particular case and the measurements of EELV, were you aware of any uh, pulmonologists or respiratory therapists measuring Mr. Floyd's EELV during the course of this incident? No. There is no evidence that that happened, and obviously it's not on the video, so it did not happen. And so any measurement would be theoretical? Yes. You were... Um, asked a question about uh, Mr. Floyd speech saying that he couldn't breathe, right? Do you recall those questions? Yes. And making those statements in the context of being in the prone position, correct? Correct. Based on your review, do you recall hearing Mr. Floyd make similar statements prior to being placed in the prone restraint position? Yes, that's my recollection. You were asked a question about uh, the anoxic seizure uh, that you observed in the video? Yes. 
and that's recognizable as an anoxic seizure to you, a physician, right? Yes. And a seizure generally involves a, a pretty significant amount of motion or movement? Objectively, Your Honor. Rephrase, sustain. How would you describe in this particular case the what you observed in terms of the anoxic seizure? A, a small amount of twitching and or extension of a body part, which is very classical of hypoxic seizures, um, often commonly described by in, in situations where people have a sudden cardiac event, as well as any other. It's just a situation of the brain not getting enough oxygen, and very different from the grand mal type seizure that you would see in an epileptic, okay. which are much, much more vigorous. And recognizable to you as a physician or other physicians with uh, comparable experience? Yes. To your knowledge, is Mr. Chauvin a physician of 27 years? No. You were asked a question about PEA, pulseless electrical activity, right? Yes. Can a PEA arrhythmia occur from a cardiac origin? Yes. You were asked a second series of questions about EELV measurements uh, in terms of, and again, I know, understand you're not a pulmonologist, right? Um, are people variable? Every one of us as a human being is, is, is completely individual and different from the person standing next to us, yes. You were asked a series of questions about the paraganglioma. Yes. And whether you recalled Mr. Floyd ever saying or complaining of a headache. I, re I recall that question, yes. Do you recall Mr. Floyd saying that everything hurts? Yes. Do you recall him at any time saying his head hurts? I have a recollection of it, but I cannot put my finger on it. It's just in my memory. Paraganglioma, um, if gone unrecognized, can that cause hypertension? Yes. Specifically, if it's one of the forms that does secrete adrenaline. Continuously or spur or both. both. You were, you were asked a series of questions about, uh, you would agree, uh, agree, your agreement that it's important not to mislead the jury, right? Correct. And you were shown a f couple of still photographs of time uh, from a body-worn camera where it appeared that Mr. Chauvin had his arm around the neck of Mr. Floyd. In that area, yes. Based upon your recollection, do you know if that was a moment in time during which Mr. Floyd made those comments? I don't have an association of that hold with him making a statement. Um, and I re recall it being fairly brief, a brief period that the um, arm was around the neck. I'd like to show you about a one minute portion of Exhibit 43, which is already in evidence. Let me publish. Body camera at twenty eighteen zero zero. 
I'm going to switch it over to you. Twenty eighteen zero zero. That's fine. Flee! Take a step! Ah! Flee, mate! Flee! No! Oh, you can't do anything! I can't choke! I can't run, Bobby! Flee! Take a second. Do you hear what Mr. Floyd is saying in that second? Yes. Do you hear what Mr. Floyd is saying in that second? Yes. Do you see where he's located in the squad car? He's closest to the sidewalk at that particular stage, yes. Okay. On the driver's side of the vehicle. Do you observe Mr. Chauvin at that point? No. You can play again. No, 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 I can't do I can't I can't choke. I can't no, run, Bobby. Please. Please. You're talking. I'm sorry, if you can just keep Please. it. Please. 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 I'm going down. I'm going down. I'm going down. I'm not going to run, man. Right, 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 right. Right. I know I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You're talking and you're ah. not Do you observe uh, that in that instance? Yes. Did it appear to you that Mr. Chauvin had a tight, firm grip around Mr. Floyd's neck? No, actually it looked very loose and the hand was actually gripping the back of the neck in this sort of spinal column area um, with a considerable gap in the front. Thank you, Doctor. I have no further questions. Any further, Mr. Blackwell? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Dr. Fowler, just for a, a point of clarification, uh, you've been asked a couple of rounds of questions about uh, the drugs found in Squad 320. To be clear, what we're talking about is one pill, right? I cannot recall if it's one or two, but it, it, it was one of those two numbers, yes. One partially dissolved pill, right? I thought it was two, but I, I stand corrected, Counselor. And in the back of squad uh, 320, you didn't see any footage of Mr. Floyd spitting a pill out, did you? No, I did not. Um, now, you asked questions about the measurements of the EELV, and I think you arrived at the conclusion with Mr. Nelson that there could have been theoretical measurements made. Uh, did you make any theoretical measurements of the EELV as a part of your analysis in this case? No, I did not. Um, I want to ask you about, again, the 9 minutes and 29 seconds. Uh, the last 9 minutes and 29 seconds of uh, Mr. Floyd's life during the subdual and the restraint. Um, to be sure I understand your testimony. So if we focus just on the period of time when Mr. Floyd is on the ground, the subdual, the restraint, and the neck compression, can you tell us whether it is your opinion, opinion as to whether or not Mr. Chauvin's actions played any role in the death of Mr. Floyd during the subdual, restraint, and compression on the ground? Objection, Mr. Uh, can you tell us uh, whether it's your view that uh, Mr. Floyd's uh, passing uh, after the 9 minutes and 29 seconds was uh, coincidental and unrelated to the subdual and restraint on the ground? Objection beyond the scope. Sustained. No further questions for you. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, you Thank you very much, Your Honor. Helpful cyber.
Okay, members of the jury, just checking on uh, how long the next witness would take. I think it is the best way to do this is to schedule that for tomorrow. So we're going to release you for today. We'll start up between 9.15 and 9.30 tomorrow. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Don't talk to anyone. Do not have any. Uh, don't watch the news. Thank you.